If last month's Fed meeting was really about the market had done the work for the Fed, this month's meeting is going to be about, well, the market undid all that work. They have a perception issue with Main Street versus Wall Street and making sure that inflation expectations are anchored. The market has a decent chance of slowing down next year. Does it mean it's a massive crash? No, not necessarily. Our view still is for a soft landing. And I think that's the challenge for equity assets in particular. It's not going to be all Goldilocks. It's not going to be easy. But we do think that there is a path for inflation to continue to come down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live at the Apollo. I just wanted to say that. I, I said that a few more times this morning. <laughs> Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. For our audience worldwide, this is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio at Apollo. Global Management Headquarters here in New York City alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Let's start with this market. Equity futures slightly negative this morning on the S&P 500. The S&P down yesterday as well. Double-digit basis point moves on Friday. Yields lower. Then Monday, yields higher. And TK seemingly on absolutely nothing. Yeah, it's on nothing. And you give up Friday two days in a row that were weaker here. I think the, the zeitgeist out there, particularly for the fancy people, is all that money that piled in from alternative investments, CTAs, as they're called, and that. And there's a huge gaming right now of, OK, that was nice. Now what? Short term. But what's it mean long term with the Fed shift and the importance of the Friday jobs report? It's starting to feel another narrative shift coming this way, because basically we were all of a sudden the Fed's going to cut rates aggressively next year. This is where we were. The market was pricing that in. And yesterday people were like, this Maybe. Is, uh, Took it's, too far. it's you know, feeling a little uncomfortable. And that was sort of how I viewed the price action. Today's all about the economic data. We'll get job openings and the ISM. TK, I'm sitting here wondering just how relevant job openings now are given this labor market is still pretty decent and yet inflation keeps yeah, coming down. Yeah, I agree. This is not a jolt that's going to be that important. What I'm wondering about is this coffee so damn good. Coffee's good, eh? It's like, it's like... Coffee's good. Yeah, it's like... It's you approve? Like, it's, I approve. Um, I think that the jolt survey is less important than normal, but boy, is claims important and onto the jobs report and the wage dynamic, Lisa giving a disinflationary tendency there. I love how every morning we're like, this isn't going to be important. Fed officials are going to speak. No one's going to care. We're going to hear about, uh, you know, what's going to happen with services. Eh, it's not a big deal. And then it is, right? And then we get a number that surprises everybody and feeds into a new narrative that was already taking place because people are pushing back against the old narrative. And all of a sudden, boom, we have something new. Well, and talk, that's the way this is services, worked. John. China, overnight, small piece of information. Yeah, not good. China's services, but China's services was actually pretty good versus all the balance sheet challenges that they have. So we've got to do two things this morning and throughout this morning here at Apollo. We've got to talk about the cycle and we've got to talk about the industry. And a word, a phrase you'll hear repeatedly throughout this morning, Bramo, debanking, the process of debanking and the opportunities it creates for places like this one. The fact that a lot of uh, bigger banks are getting out of consumer lending, they're getting out of direct lending to a lot of specific companies, particularly smaller ones, who's going to take that place? Increasingly, private credit private equity firms have filled that role, and it now takes on a new kind of preeminence yeah. when a lot of banks say they don't even want to be in the business. And what's interesting, and this goes to all the management and the, and the talent here at Apollo Global Management, basically we're 15 years on from a huge financial shock, and this entire industry was birthed out of the debris of 08 and 09. Absolutely stacked lineup this morning. I'll go through the names for you in just a moment. Let's start with the scores in financial markets, starting with the S&P 500. Futures pulling back just a touch. Equities down yesterday, down again this morning. We're negative a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Into the bond market, yields lower by just a single basis point. Can we call that stability? I think for now we can. Yeah. 424 on a US 10-year. In the FX market, the euro, 108.35, going absolutely nowhere. And to wrap it up, Bramo, crude, 73.40, with positive by 0.5%. In about four hours, we do get the U.S. October jolt survey, which Tom just said is not going to be important at all. I actually am watching this. We're also going to get U.S. services ISM data for November. But the jolts data matters when it does tick in the wrong direction. It has been bleeding lower. Job openings have been coming down. What if they go the opposite way? What if they go again in the opposite direction? Today we'll hear from Wells Fargo CEO Charlie Scharf, Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan, and Goldman CFO Dennis Coleman, all at the Goldman Sachs U.S. Financial Services Conference. I care about this simply because I want to hear any commentary similar to what we heard from Walmart. Are things starting to deteriorate at a rapid pace in the same kind of way, or do they still see that same stability? 
And there are earnings for a number of smaller companies today. And I'm actually really interested in peanut butter and jam, jam smucker, but also Land's End, AutoZone, Dave & Buster's, Toll Brothers, uh, McDonald's has its investors day. I could tell you're laughing at me. Oh, because half the time I don't believe you. <laughs> that I actually care about peanut butter and yeah. jam. Well, you know, this is actually the bread and butter, forgive me, nice. of, of, you know, oh, the United nice. States. And so nice. we're dealing with you a that, Russell 2000. You? I actually yeah. didn't, right. but, you know, I just took a page from you yesterday. But the Russell 2000 has been underperforming. Do we see a different signal from smaller companies? That's something that actually is taking on more importance than a lot of other economic data that's been coming out. Should we start the program? Let's start the program. <laughs> As opposed to that. <laughs> Jim Zouter joins us now, the co-president of Apollo Global Management. Jim, good morning to you. Good morning and uh, welcome to Apollo. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Price, I said, the coffee's good and the price the, is even better, the, right? The coffee's yeah, good well. and the price is free and we like that. You that like works that, for you, right, Tom? They have a tip jar. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> you got to put money in? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is he called, this is card. the, uh, you, you're, you're making uh, the show today from our Contrarian Cafe. So we welcome you. Nice. And you have a great lineup this morning. So we're excited to have you here and tell, tell, tell you more about our story. That great lineup begins with you. I mentioned a little bit earlier, there is a call on the cycle that we can talk about. There's also a call on the industry. Let's start with the industry. That phrase I mentioned moments ago, debanking, perfect place to start. What is debanking and what does it mean for you and the team? Well, you know, I don't use that term. I, I really use the evolution of finance. Um, the reality is that we, the last 40 years, we had amazing uh, tailwinds with globalization and technology and lower rates. Uh, banks became, they were, they were advisors for, for decades. Uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, they became large global institutions. 08, 09 happens, and there's a tremendous amount of legislation, Dodd-Frank, to change their business model, but at the same time, rates were lower. Uh, and in the last 15 years, CEOs, the CEOs you're going to have on today from Wells and from other places, they're focused on ROE and their shareholder return. And as they're focused on ROE and shareholder return, there's a massive gap where companies need to find capital. And firms like Apollo, we've been at the front of the, front of the uh, parade in terms of providing capital across our business. Um, and when you put that together with our funding model of LP capital from around the globe, plus our retirement services, we're just a very unique player in that's going on. We've got to get into how big the addressable market is and what sure. are private markets. Sure. Typically, we think of leveraged finance. Mark Rowe and your colleague, who we'll catch up with a little bit sure. later this morning, talks about basically everything that's on a bank balance sheet. How big is this going to be? You know, when, we, when most people talk about, and you did a great job right there, talking about private capital and private markets, most people, when they talk about private credit today, they talk about direct origination, which is about a trillion five. It's about a third of the high yield and loan markets. We think the definition of private capital and private credit is around a 40 trillion number. And that would consist of, you know, solar finance, inventory finance, trade finance, uh, franchise finance, along with a lot of this corporate lending and investment grade privates that a lot of banks used to hold large chunks on their balance sheet. But again, in their search for ROE and appropriate returns, they're not the right place to hold that. They may be the right place to originate it, but they're certainly not the right place to hold it long term. In our three hours with you, I think I, I want to get out of the way right away the stereotype that it's highfalutin, fancy derivatives, fancy structures, mezzanine. Everybody walks around and says mezzanine. We have mezzanine coffee. Everyone? We have mezzanine Danish. But the reality is it's shockingly conservative. On your website, you lead with retirement services. How conservative, how measured, how prudent is Apollo? Well, at the end of the day, we do not like to lose money, and that even means a penny. Um, the reality is, if you look at our firm today, $630 billion, uh, about $100 billion in private equity, about $100 billion in real estate and infrastructure, $400 plus billion in credit, a vast, vast majority of that is investment grade. And in this year alone, whether it's Air France, Venovia, AT&T, we're loaning money to great companies that are, a lot of them are investment grade. And it's interesting, you know, you talk around the globe right now, the last six, seven weeks, you know, buying investment grade debt of companies like Merck and Meta and many, many others, you've been making a double digit return between of the compression of spreads uh, and otherwise. Now that's in the public markets, but back to the private credit, to your point, we, we lend to large companies, mostly investment grade, and for our perspective, back to Jonathan's question, it's not a one and a half trillion opportunity, it's really a 40 trillion opportunity. So let's talk about where we are. You said yeah. you don't like to lose a penny, and yet you've been focused on investment grade, which is underperformed yeah. high yield. Yeah. Risk has done a lot better than lower risk securities. Yeah. 
Where are we in terms of where you can make the most money? Is it still an investment grade despite where we are right now? Well, it's in, it's in higher quality credit. The reality is there's still this debate, and you'll have it with Torsten later on, soft landing, Ooh. hard landing, uh, your friend Mr. Slock. But the reality is the economy <clears throat> is we're sort of a little bit in this interesting Goldilocks period right now. Um, concern about a slowdown has been on everybody's mind the last six, seven months. Fed's actually done a really nice job of maintaining higher rates. So I would argue that the Fed put its or, or, or to back in the market right now. And the reality is you can make, as people are worrying about soft and hard landing, in credit, you've been making double-digit returns in the last six to nine months. So the Fed put its back. We can't let that go. What exactly does that mean? Does that mean that we're not going to have the same kind of credit cycle that now you are a believer no, in I, soft I, landing? No, I, I think what you're going to see is you're going to see an economy that there's going to be winners and losers, certainly like in inflation. Uh, you're seeing it right now in the goods section, goods area, where goods prices are lower but services are a bit higher. And I'm just saying as the, as the economy is, is navigating what's going on right now, the Fed has maintained a fairly high rates. The, the market's gotten ahead of it, if you will. And if there were any kind of challenging economic mm -hmm. backdrop, the Fed does have a loaded gun that they can use as needed and as appropriate. I'm not assuming it's going to happen. I think you're going to see what we're all expecting. You know, we're students of history. We expect to happen in 08 to happen again. Right. I don't think you're going to see that happen right now. I think the actual reality is the banking system in the U.S., the envy of the world, and it's actually quite robust. There are signs of the economy that are a bit more challenging. There are a lot of buyouts that have been done that will have a challenging time, but you're just going to have to navigate it with a really broad toolbox. You mentioned the history. On an almost cultural basis, one of my themes is we had 73, 74, Pittsburgh rolled up. You and I lived it in western New York. And the bottom line is then we had 77, a second leg of a great bull market starting into the 82 expansion. Is that the analog right now, that after the gloom of the pandemic and the churning, that there's something new here, constructive? Well, there's no doubt in the, you know, if you talk about those, those four uh, tailwinds that I talked about, globalization, lower rates, deregulation, the fourth is technology. And there are those who know a lot more about it than I do, but they would argue that we are on the precipice with what's going on with AI, cost structure, education, and the breadth of that, that that could have a huge impact. But the reality is the cost of capital is going to be higher for the next five or seven years. We are in a higher cost of capital environment. And it's how you navigate. And back to your original question, like the reality is the bank, the banking system around the globe is evolving. The U.S. is in the front of that. And as you'll hear about this morning, we think we're a, we are the player as that industry continues to evolve. We've got to set it up for the rest of this morning. There will be people at home asking this following question. So help us answer it. Are we not just transferring the risk from banks and the risk they pose to the economy to places like this? Well, we're actually taking the risk that was consolidated on a bunch of financial institutions and bringing it to a much, much broader system where we're diversifying that risk. Because our investors, at the end of the day, are either sovereign or other pension funds that don't own these assets on leverage or their other retirement services. So we're, we're, we're going higher quality assets and we're diversifying the risk of the system. It's actually making the system less risky. Jim, this was awesome. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Here. Well, welcome today, and we look forward to a great morning. It's going to be fantastic. Jim's out to there of Apollo it's Global great. Management. Mark Roman coming up in, I think, about an hour from now. Torsten Slock of Apollo joining us in about 15 minutes' time. TK, a lot to get into this morning. A lot to get into, and particularly from where we are. I mean, to get into 2024 with the challenges of the bank, two streets over, folks, is Fortress Diamond. Did you see how tall that thing is? It's massive. They just topped it out. It's, like, massive. It, it, it's, like ginormous. And here, do you know who I saw coming up? Who'd you see? Bobby Axelrod. He's a couple floors above this. Couldn't believe it. It's like, oh my God. Do you watch it's Billions? Do, I, I'm on Billions. Yes, I of course I'm on Billions. billions. We're all on Billions. Yeah, yeah, yeah Lisa. Yeah. Bramble's on like every third episode. All right. But it's coming up. But, but you know, it's... <laughs> you look at me. I'm supposed to say something with that. <laughs> like, you really want me to comment? <laughs> Let's move on. Isn't that how this show works, Bramble? <laughs> yeah, you, just... you talk. That's what happens. <laughs> okay. You engage the camera and you make something Thank up. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. We'll figure it out. Equities <laughs> negative on the S&P 500. Coming up very shortly in the next hour, Mark Rowan of Apollo. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Next year, it's all going to be about these policy gaps, which central bank is going to cut first um, and which one is going to lag, or is it all going to be symmetric? 
Uh, and the way I think we're being set up for next year is that the ECB is most likely to go first. Uh, if we look at the most recent inflation data, I would argue the ECB uh, should actually be cutting next week. Should, not will. The message from George Saravellos there, the global head of FX research over at Deutsche Bank. He believes this ECB should be cutting interest rates next week. Thinks the ECB will go before the Federal Reserve. We heard that from Jeff Yu of BNY Mellon in the last week as well. Here at Apollo, already this morning here in New York City, we've got a headline for you. Bramo reads as follows. The Fed put is back according to Jim Zelter. The fact that Jim Zelter was a real skeptic of Goldilocks and all of a sudden is saying, well, they've got a loaded gun in his words and they can deploy it if there is any kind of economic weakness. This is exactly what we heard earlier. And you and I both laughed. We said, no way. This is absolute, you know, highfalutin kind of wishful thinking. Uh, ben Laidler basically came out and he said the Fed put his back. And you and I were so skeptical. And now we hear Jim Zelter basically saying the same thing. And frankly, that's what we've seen priced into yeah, the market. Bouncing against this is nominal GDP. I, 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 John, you mentioned yesterday the importance of what we heard from George Cerevelos. And you wonder what the modeled nominal GDP is for in Europe versus the United States. If you get the sub 2% GDP now and add on some form of disinflation, do we have U.S. GDP 4% or lower? And what's it in Europe as well? I so think that's the key distinction, it's Tom. It's a key distinction. The growth profile in Europe has been absolutely dreadful. Yeah. We thought they might be fighting, confronting stagflation in the last 12 months. They've already had a recession in certain countries in Europe. In the United States, we have to sit on this a little bit longer. We're having a conversation about the prospect of recession next year after a quarter of 5% real GDP growth. TK, and unemployment still sat the 4%. That's how bizarre this moment is. Well, again, yeah, the unemployment is a U.S. metric. Did we finally see the labor market crack again on Friday? So important. But again, I would just go to the combined animal spirit of two moving parts. One is real GDP clearly coming down, and the other is what level of disinflation will we see, and does that set up lethargy or something, I hate the phrase soft landing, but something that we can live with is Jim Zeltner. I thought he had... A pretty optimistic tone there. Let's get to the scores briefly. I'll just whip through the price action for you, starting with the S&P 500. Futures coming in just a touch. Soft start to the week. We're negative here, T-Count, the S&P. We're down about a third of 1%. <clears throat> Very good. We are at Apollo Global Management. And what's going to be wonderful about this is the different themes that they have. Uh, Ari Jacobs is Global Head of Investments for Aon, part of uh, what they do here at Apollo. And that is about institutional money and particularly the forefront of their retirement uh, services. Thank you so much for joining us today, for having us uh, here as, as well. Uh, there's a 5% money market fund out there. You are the wise one. What's going to happen to the flows when the 5% breaks? Well, from an institutional investor standpoint, I think when we're, when we're looking at organizations, um, we think that they should be at some points agnostic about rates in some of their discussions that they're making. So when we, when we work with our defined benefit clients and our institutional clients, um, they're on a glide path help them consider what should be going on with rates. Are you um, going to change the actuarial assumption? I mean, this is really the money issue for institutions right now. You have to adjust over the next three years your core actuarial assumption coming out of the pandemic. So, so I, I'd say two things about it. Um, first thing would be that we, um, we're always looking to hedge those risks in our pension plan liabilities with, uh, with our clients. And in understanding that, we're going to be going out and looking at that hedged whether or not the rates are 2%, 5%, or 8%. Um, but what's also happening at that same time is that the equity risk premium, as we're evaluating the future, is probably narrowing a bit. So that's going to allow our clients to continue to move down their glide paths, as we call it, from, a, from an investing standpoint in defined, benefits, in, in defined benefit plans, and allow them to work through that um, as their funded statuses have been improving. So the rate part of it is relevant to us, but it's just allowing them to do more with their improved funded statuses. Let's talk about the conversation and build on the conversation we had with Jim just moments ago. Do you see the approaches to retirement savings changing? Are we going to be shifting more into private markets in years to come? Um, in certain parts of the market, yes. I mean, there's no question that there's more opportunity in private markets with some of our clients. At the same time, there's a lot of discussion around the need for liquidity. So as these organizations have their pension plans continue to evolve over time, it gets smaller. Um, they need that liquidity. So there's this constant balance between the look for liquidity in pension plans with the need for grabbing yields to match their liability growth. So we see a continued move towards 
private markets, but at the same time balancing with liquidity needs. Mark Roman's going to talk about this later, but I think it's worth addressing with you first. Why do I need, as an individual, daily liquidity when I'm making a 50-year trade? Right. Um, so you need daily liquidity for a few reasons. Number one, organizations at times decide to go out and settle a large percentage of their corporate liabilities with insurance companies. And when they're working through that, that liquidity becomes critical in that exercise. The insurance companies that are taking that on are seeking some of that liquidity, and we need that to make those transactions happen. Uh, second part of it is that organizations also at times out of their pension plans pay out lump sums where they're paying individuals a single amount based upon the way the plan rules are written, and they're going to need the liquidity for those transactions. Too. Those are paid out in cash. To Tom's point, 8.5% used to be the bogey. Then all of a sudden people were like, that's not realistic. We're going to talk 7.5%. No, maybe 7% that we have to do for earnings yeah. for some of these institutional portfolios. Are we back up to 8.5% in this higher rate world? No. I don't think we're back up to 8.5% is what we expect those returns to be at. Um, I think that we will see the uh, continued effort towards ensuring that you are uh, putting that risk ahead of the return to balance out what still needs to be done with the continued effort of de-risking pension plans. So organizations are not going back to the traditional 70-30 or 60-40 type of portfolio, and they still are working towards managing their risks and therefore grabbing fixed income securities over, over equity producing securities to get to that 8.5%. So we're not seeing that yet. What proportion of <clears throat> pensions, et cetera, are not really managing the money themselves at all that have really just shifted to insurance companies that basically are the biggest asset managers in the world now? So um, on a year by year basis, we've seen out of the $2 trillion or so corporate defined benefit market, somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to $50 billion each year is is going backwards, it's going, going to the insurance companies. So it's about 2 to 3% a year is moving in that direction. Um, we see that trend continuing for a while. It's been out there for a couple of years and working in that regard. Uh, we, there's a different trend out there where organizations are outsourcing all the decisions related to their defined benefit plans and their pension plans. That continues as well. So that's a separate trend from those that are transferring to insurance companies. I've got to ask you this question. I know it's at the top of the list at Apollo Global Management. I want you to use your tough math, tough mathematics right now <laughs> and tell me, should I be able to buy Bitcoin off an ETF in my <laughs> retirement plan, institutional <laughs> retail? Where are you on Bitcoin? Yeah. The whole world's watching. This is the question. Right really now, here it is. Where am I <laughs> yeah, yeah, Bitcoin? Yeah. yeah. No way. <laughs> why, why no way? Yeah. Why no way? You know, look, in these, it, so my technical answer to that question would be, sure, have an open brokerage window and go buy whatever oh, you want. It's an, abomin fine country. It, it's an abomination but, of the Employment Retirement Income Security Act but, of 1974. But, and, <laughs> so I, I don't know if I can compete with that statement, but no, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I would say that investments like that probably have better places than in your ERISA plan. Much more diplomatic. Uh, Jay Clayton. That was better than Bobby Axel. Jay Clayton, <laughs> former SEC chair, joining yeah. us this hour, by the way. I know. These are questions you can ask him. Preparing. What do you want to ask him? Bitcoin. Bitcoin? Is That's that what, what you want to go straight off the listeners or viewers? This straight is, to Bitcoin. Are you going to leave the next me? hour? Bitcoin in your retirement plan? I wanted to ask about Azempic and people living Please. longer. We've run out of time. We'll get to that another time. Ari, good to see you. Thank you, Ari, sir. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ari Jacobs there of Aon. Thank you very much. TK, we shall talk about Bitcoin in about 30 minutes' time. And then in about 40 minutes from now, we'll catch up with Mark Ryan, the CEO <laughs> of this shop, and then Torsten Slock of Apollo, chief economist, joining us in around about five minutes' time. TK, we need to talk about the Federal Reserve. I know we're yes. sick to death of it. The good news is that we are in the quiet period. No Fed speak through the rest of this week until thank next God week when we get that. a Fed decision. Well, you get the Fed decision next week, but it's going to come off the decision at 8.30 on Friday. I mean, can we all agree, like, claims is a surveyed number, and it'll be shocked. What if we get a sub-100 jobs? What does that do? That makes the Zelter pit put, rather, the Zelter put and to the moon. I miss the Fed speak. I wish that we had Fed speak this week. No, you don't. I think that it would be no, really nice to have them jawboning the market <clears throat> now in the other direction or trying to weigh in and give nuances that people can blame them for. What happened to Lisa? Like, where's Bremer? <laughs> I mean, she'll be back where's later Bremer? on. You know. Did we bring what the Bremer cam Lisa? on our remote here? What did we they do? It's, it's that it's camera the coffee. right there. It's that Fruit. camera right there. Makes Torsten Slock of Apollo coming up next. We'll try and find Bremer from New York City. This is Bloomberg.
live from Apollo Global Management. Good morning to you all. Let's check out the price action from New York City. Equity futures pulling back just a touch on the S&P 500. Negative here by a third of 1%. Down about 0.5 on the Nasdaq. I have to say the Nasdaq's been a bit of a struggle over the last few weeks. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Let's turn to the bond market. Yesterday, again, a double-digit basis point move on a two-year yield. I wish I could tell you why. I wish I could tell you why. Maybe it was Friday we just moved aggressively lower for no real reason. Chairman Powell getting absolutely steamrolled. We'll talk about that in just a moment. On a 10-year, down a single basis point. Let's call it 424. Headline already this morning, Jim Zouter of Apollo, the co-president, TK, talking up. The Fed puts back. The Fed put his back. Well, it was with the news flow, and that's what's been missing the last two days. And, you know, I, I get there's a lot of gloom out there and reaffirmation of uh, down we go, some of the S&P uh, statistics looking a little shaky. But what we're really doing is waiting for a reaffirmation of the news flow that put the put back in place last week. Going into next week, the Federal Reserve and the ECB. Bit of a tug of war going on here. Who cuts first? I think overwhelmingly the consensus suggesting that will be the ECB. That's why the euro is facing some headwinds at the moment. The euro against the dollar shaping up as follows. 108 about 20. 108.24 at the moment. Almost totally unchanged, Lisa. Nothing new about that sometimes. Happens almost every single morning. But we have seen some price action here. Yesterday, on what we saw over the last week, I think the last week, really, just to sum it all up, euro weakness in the face of a monster move at the front end, the Treasury curve, because it's not just about the Fed in isolation, it's about the ECB, and seemingly the rate cut conversation has restarted big time over there. The fact that Jeff Yu is saying that, yes, the ECB, he agreed, the idea that the uh, ECB will cut first, but then saying that he sees parity between the euro and the dollar at some point next year because of what you're seeing in the weakness of the economy, in addition to potentially a greater number of rate cuts uh, than over in the U.S. Some big calls going into next year. That's some of the price action. Let's get you some of the top stories. Under surveillance this morning, Moody's cutting China's credit outlook to negative from stable, citing deepening concerns about the country's level of debt. The greater saying China's usage of fiscal stimulus to support local governments and its spiraling property downturn is posing risk to the nation's economy. The government pushing Back, surprise, surprise, saying it is, quote, Lisa, disappointed with Moody's decision and that the economy will be highly resilient and its large potential. Yeah, well, I mean, no kidding. What are they going to say? Of course they're going to say that. What was interesting to me about Moody's uh, rating decision was that they said part of the decision came from China's likelihood of offering up stimulus and that this would erode their resilience in the face of further well, crises. There's been an ultimate Beijing put for 40 years. But it hasn't come into play to the degree that so many people thought that it would. So at this point, you've got Moody saying that, yeah, it's going to come back into play to some right. degree, but that it will erode uh, the fiscal backdrop of the country. And other people are saying the, it's not going to be enough. The giant George Magnus was heated about this out on Twitter. And, and George said, look, this is deeply, deeply unsettling uh, time. And the answer is they're not playing by a normal rule book, just beginning with the complete change we've seen in Hong Kong. So I think conventional analysis this year, John, doesn't work. I don't think we can emphasize enough just how wrong the consensus has been on China this year. Coming into 2023, the U.S. faced the prospect of recession and China was going to boom as they reopened the economy. Flip that upside down. China struggled big time. The economy's been a problem and the market has really underperformed relative to the United States. And Lisa, that makes you wonder what we're getting so wrong right now about the consensus going into 2024. Well, a lot of people, including Peter Scheer yesterday, was saying he's getting bullish in China, not as a long-term play, but just simply because it's gotten beaten up so much. Enough people have said it's uninvestable. <clears throat> so at this point, heading into next year, do you start to see China outperform and the U.S. underperform? Basically, the playbook, bring it out from last year, Dust it up, right. put it back out for 2024 and just say, we were right, it was just a year late. What did Jim call the coffee bar behind us, the contrarian coffee bar? Exactly. Let's get to a contrarian call. JP Morgan making a bearish call on equities in 2024, saying this. Well, some of the biggest banks on Wall Street are calling for the S&P to hit fresh record highs next year. The chief global equity strategist, Dubravko Lekos Bujas, sees peril for equities. As an economic slowdown is expected to pressure earnings, the bank writing, quote, the market is pricing in effectively some sort of soft landing and many are calling for Goldilocks. TK, in the view of the investment banker JP Morgan, that's unrealistic. It's a sum total and even more confusing from a big bank. In Apollo Global Management, everyone's on the same page. 
I'm kidding. No division. No division at all at Apollo Global Management. But at these banks, you've got fractious views. And this is one view out there. I wonder where Mr. Diamond fits into the 4200 or 4600 or the Yardeni 5000 view. Here at Apollo, if anyone disagrees, they send them to the contrarian bar and say, just sit there for a while until you get on the same page. Now, honestly, to me, this is a question. We can agree with the idea that Goldilocks is a pretty narrow slot that you've got to fit through. And a lot of people are pushing back against the scenario that people are looking at. Um, However, what does that mean in terms of stocks, which have been divorced from the economic I, fundamentals this is so in any unusual. kind of way? I, I'm completely, John, divorced from paying attention to outlooks. I just... <laughs> I, I get it. It's a marketing thing. You know, there's like six slugs here at Apollo. They have to go into Mr. Zelter and they're shaking. They're physically shaking when they go in. They got to come up with estimates for the road show. I mean, that's what this is you about. You have the luxury of ignoring it because we follow it so closely I, I, on your behalf. I'm humbled by how wrong I was a year ago. <laughs> sure. I think everyone is. Yeah. Right, I think most people. I'm are. taking a meeting after this here about triple leverage oh, yeah. ETF. Can you smell the bacon. I'm just so distracted by the smell of bacon. I know it's like protein so a lot. <laughs> Let's get you a mover. Shares of Nokia dropping after AT and T taps rival Ericsson <clears throat> for a 14 billion dollar deal. The deal aiming to modernise AT and T's wireless network over the next five years. Ericsson is already responsible for about two thirds of AT and T's US network. A significant win over Nokia, which accounts for the other third. Nokia. Lisa, getting absolutely hammered. Which has hit me kind of interesting because we've seen more deals recently. I just want to point this out. More deals have actually been getting done. And I understand that that's sort of a generalization from one particular deal that's been going on for a long time. But it seems like companies are actually taking decisions that the CFOs aren't just lost in la-la uncertainty land. And they're actually making conviction calls. I find that interesting. Yeah, Alaska okay. Rares won. Yeah. Saw that yes, in the last correct. 24 hours, the prospect of another deal in the Permian Basin. Maybe you get some IPOs next yeah. year and investment bankers might be happy. Down into 2024. They might be happier at least. Happier, <laughs> relatively speaking, Tom. We are here at Apollo Global Management and joining us now, someone you are very familiar with, Torsten Slock, of course, holding court at Deutsche Bank for years, dragged over to Apollo to provide economic uh, wisdom. And we're thrilled that he would host us here uh, today. Nice coffee. We're coming next week. You have one single sentence in your report. This time around, it's not the Friday jobs report. It's the Thursday Friday jobs report because the optimists are hanging on claims. How important are claims? Well, that's really a critical question when it comes to this uh, employment report on Friday for November. Jobless claims has been surprisingly resilient for a very long period now. It, it's beginning to look more not like a soft landing or hard landing, but more like a long-term landing. We are waiting more and more and more for any evidence of either a sharp or slowdown or an acceleration. And what we do have on the labor market on the slowdown side is, as we'll get today, the JOLTS data has been showing the quits rate mm -hmm. has been coming down, meaning the number of people who voluntarily quits their jobs has been declining. The number of job openings has been coming down. The work week has been coming down. Wages for job switches relative to job stayers has been converging. In other words, you no longer have as much bargaining power if you change jobs. Combined with the number of people who are changing jobs uh, for permanent reasons well, has also been changing. So the conclusion is we still have more and more evidence pointing in the direction of the labor market softening. One indicator jobless claims, yes, still good. Okay. But basically everything else is pointing in the direction of what you would expect, namely a weaker labor market. Okay, demand. I want a single point nine farm payrolls estimate, but they won't serve me the bacon John was talking about. So let me go to this. Is the whisper number finally turning towards it's a look down? A set, what is it, John? 188,000 we're at? That's consensus, median yeah. estimate. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that includes the, the UAW. Uh, which is about right. 30 But is the whisper right. number coming down instead of going up this time? Well, around? if you really back up and think about what's going on, the Fed hiked rates in March of 2022, and your textbook would tell you when you raise interest rates, you should expect to see consumption begin to slow down, capex spending begin to slow down, credit growth from the banking sector begin to slow down. And all those things are happening. And all those things should also be expected to hit, in particular, lower rated credits, smaller companies, middle market companies. And that's exactly where you're beginning to see signs of weaker labor demand. So you should expect to see non-farm payrolls over the next several months do what the Fed is expecting it to do, let me gradually be softer and softer. Is this labor market right now, and this is a Neil Data question over at Remmac, is this labor market right now less of a reason to be hawkish at the Federal Reserve, even if we are printing <coughs> 200k on payrolls? Well, as Jim was saying earlier, the Fed put his back, because think about it, we have now a situation where the market is spending so much time on the Fed's minuscule small changes in their communication. And if the Fed is now beginning to say, well, we still don't think that we are there yet, the market says, well, okay, we are there yet, and you will come to that conclusion. But we've had that pivot so many times, and it remains to be seen whether that pivot this time is right. But 
the way I think we should be looking at it is in the dual <coughs> mandate, should we be focusing on inflation or employment? Inflation is moving in the right direction. Employment is moving gradually in the right direction. But if the labor market does start to have more than a soft landing, then we will certainly have a sentiment change in markets. So I never thought that I'd get to the place where Torsten Slock and Ben Laidler would agree. I think of you as a perennial pessimist. I always open your uh, your the, emails that I kind of enjoy. No, I actually we enjoy worry about it. Risks, it yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're worrying about risks and you're pointing to I'm all these risks. You're responsible. And Laidler. then you say, you know, there's a Fed put. So does that mean that Goldilocks is back on the table? Well, but the issue here is that the market has been interpreting the Fed in so many different ways for the last year. And the Fed pivot has come, I mean, seven out of the last nine times, as you will. So a variant of the old joke of how many times can you come with the same story that not, now is the time. Now is the time for the Fed to turn dovish. But they haven't turned dovish. And I think that's why we will have rates higher for longer. This is good for fixed income. This means that the front end of the curve should be still cutting coupons in terms of thinking about what is the overall outlook. It's going to take time before we get inflation under control. And I think that process, right. meaning into next year, still means that the downside risks to the outlook continues to be very pronounced. i got a question. Very pronounced. Jim from Rochester, thanks so much for watching uh, today. Torsten, I'm going to cut to the chase. There's nonlinearities out there. Along the curve that Chairman Powell looks at, where's the biggest potential nonlinearity? Is it wicked short, like Apollo short-term paper, or is it 10, 20-year French paper, 30-year, 40? Is it the Austrian piece? Where's the, where's the stress? I would look at this from a macro perspective, that the Fed has hiked rates. We're seeing delinquency rates going up on credit cards, on auto loans. In particular there's, for a there's a slack brim. We're also loads. seeing the <clears throat> default rates going up on high yield loans. It's been going up quite quickly in the last six months. You're also seeing the bank credit growth slow down quite substantially. Taking those things together, all that so far <clears throat> looks like a soft landing. Uh, but again, as I said, it's more been a long landing here. But the bottom line still is, to your question, the risk is if people wake up suddenly in the next few quarters and say, wow, maybe there's more downside risk to consumption because the hit is not only from interest rates going up. If people also start losing their jobs and the labor market soften, which is what the Fed has been talking about, we get the double whammy of both high interest rates hanging in there at the same time while the labor market finally softens, which is what the Fed has been waiting for for so long. OK, pause, because in the last week we've just had record spending, Black Friday online, Cyber Monday. Well, that was online. Busiest day on record in U.S. airports. And then buy now, pay later underpinning is that a lot good of that news growth. Or bad news? That's what I want to ask okay, you. So what remember, is it? Do you want roughly, to go sit by Brown? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> roughly half Space. of the population has used buy now, pay later. And that number has just continued to go up in the last several months. So you begin to think about, well, is that a sign that they can't get credit elsewhere, even on their credit cards? First, so I bought Rangers tickets with buy now, pay later. I know. Well, that's, <laughs> you're probably part of that hat that has used it. But I'm just saying that <laughs> the conclusion is that we're getting to the, to the bottom line here, that people are getting stressed more on the household side. Savings are mainly with the middle and high income households. Low income households are getting more and more pressure, in particular when it comes to the linkage rates. So that's, of course, implying that we will see more downside pressure on consumers over the next several Maybe quarters. this might be just the beginning of the consumer levering gap. Why isn't it that? Well, because the backdrop here is that the Fed is not going to cut rates anytime soon. So if the cost of financing stays high, or in Fed language, you will appreciate this, we will be above our star, which is two and a half, for a very right. extended Where's period. Where's the new R star? Come on. What, so, what do we got? 12 seconds? We've so, got about Williams, a minute left. Williams and Laubach would say okay. they have a methodology. Is Williams two and a half Forget them. So what do you think line, I would, Well, I would go with the Fed line here and say two and a half percent. And if you had five and a half, we will have restrictive monetary policy Can for at least a few more years. So to Jonathan's question, that means that consumers will be under pressure okay. potentially for a few more years. A guy yesterday said, he was at some German bank, he said ECB is going to go first. What's a Bundesbank going to tell Lagarde when she decides to cut? That's a real uh, wrestle inside the ECB at the moment. But the ECB okay. will go first. But it's very clear that uh, different ECB government <clears throat> council members are showing up at the meeting and, and have probably right. having different wish lists. Yeah, the Federal Reserve's on the same page maybe right now. I, I would don't say know about so. the government council so. over the ECB. Right. Torsten Slock there of Apollo. Torsten, right. thank you. TK's got a question about retiring on Bitcoin. We're going to catch up with Jay Clayton, a former yeah. SEC chairman okay. and Apollo independent chair from New York City this morning. Good morning to you all, live from Apollo Global Management. This is Bloomberg. The reality is the economy is, we're sort of a little bit in this interesting Goldilocks period right now. Um, concern about a slowdown has been on everybody's mind the last six, seven months.
Fed's actually done a really nice job of maintaining higher rates. So I would argue that the Fed put its order back in the market right now. That's the call from Jim Zelter, the co-president of Apollo Asset Management. Jim, joining us in the last hour, we're going to catch up with Mark Rowan of Apollo Global Management in around about 10 minutes' time. Look out for that conversation just around the corner. We need to start with the price action for you. The scores look like this on the S&P 500. Negative, a softer start to the week. We're down about 0.4% on the S&P. Yields coming in a couple of basis points from 4.23.56, about where we are this morning. In the FX market, the euro slightly negative. A weaker euro, stronger dollar. Euro dollar, 108.17. We're negative on that currency pair by 0.2%. I'm not sure if this is the uh, headline that Apollo wants this morning, but we heard it once from Jim Zouter and again from Torsten Slock. It appears, TK, the Fed put has returned. That's been the theme here this morning, and the answer is it's based on news. And what I find fascinating is Torsten Slock's asymmetric view of the Friday jobs report, holding it up as a constructive view on claims. And if claims slip or ebb, we get the sum of his data, which is a lesser non-farm payroll. So 180 was the median estimate for payrolls on Friday. Those estimates keep pouring in. Looking at the survey right now, TK, 189, 189. You have to yeah. bake in the UAW pop. Those yeah, people coming noise, back to work, noise, all of that stuff. Yeah. But still, you know, basically in line with what we got in the previous month. And let's month. not forget wage inflation as well. I mean, the heart and soul of this is somehow disinflation clicks in and even wages crack to something more, more reasonable. And then all of a sudden you've got, as Neil Dutta, the optimist, would say, real income growth. Income's up and with disinflation, lesser wage inflation. That's a virtuous cycle. Would you like a Bitcoin check? Yeah, I think we need a Bitcoin check. The 42... 393 was the high of the session, Tom. <clears throat> 41,671 right now. Yeah, it's going to be interesting Thank to you. See. That's your Bitcoin check. <laughs> yeah. That's like the extent of our Bitcoin checks on this program. <laughs> 42K TK in the last 24 hours. Huge move. Pop it. I mean, you loaded the boat at 16,000. You look like a genius. All this excitement I mean, about this Bitcoin ETF that might be just around the corner. Yeah, well, I'm with Ari, uh, Ari Jacobs, who we, we talked to earlier, where really maybe not... Time now for a three-hour interview. He's dreading it. Jay Clayton joins us now. Just to, so you'll understand, if you grew up in a certain neck of the Appalachian Mountains, if your father worked at Hershey's Chocolate, you had the coolest father within 500 miles. That would be Mr. Clayton, who had lots of Hershey's in the kitchen at home and went on to a sterling career in law with a modest New York City law firm, chosen as SEC chairman, an eventful chairmanship, but less so than the pain and agony that Mr. Gensler is going to. He is independent chair of Apollo. How tough is it for Gary Gensler right now? How tough, you know, the, the battles that are going on. Do you look at it and go, that's worse than I had? <laughs> well, look, those, the, the, those jobs are tough, okay? Because no matter what decisions you make, you're going to make somebody unhappy. And people who are happy never tell you thank you. But people who are unhappy say, you know, what are you doing? Yeah. And so it's the, they're not easy jobs, but, you know. Brahma, yeah, Brahma's got some adult questions. I'm going to get this out of the way right now. Gensler's dealing with this allure for some people of ETFs with Bitcoin. A retail's ability to put Bitcoin in regulated entities, ETFs, funds, retirement plans, uh, whatever. It, it's captured the imagination of our audience. What's your thought on this? I mean, is it a legitimate asset? Okay, I'm not going to give you investment advice on this, but I think we're at the point where the market is going to decide over time whether Bitcoin is a legitimate asset or not. It's really not for regulators to say, you know what, that's not an asset that you should be invested in. It is an asset you should be invested in. My view is it's already in the ecosystem. Let's bring it in the, in the ecosystem. And to your point about retirement funds, should you be putting you know, your retirement funds in Bitcoin a substantial portion? Of course not. Of course not. We should have we should have fiduciaries advising people around that. But it's it's there. It's something people want. Let's let's get it inside the regulated system as much as as we can and have the market decide. From when you were on the on the watch, I remember one day John on set, I looked at one full page ad. Commissions are free. Turn the page of the Wall Street Journal. Commissions are free. Turn the page. Commissions are free. Those kind of shops where it's cheap commissions, that's going to bring up trading of things like Bitcoin, isn't it? I mean, it's going to, you can't tell me that Bitcoin is the same as an open-ended investment company wrapped around 33 and 34. It's, it's, it's not, but there already are exchange-traded products, futures-based exchange-traded products for, for Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So why don't we at least give people the most efficient product? Right. And let's try to get as much efficacy in the trading market as we can. 
so we understand it, so people here can have these kinds of discussions. Look, if you asked, if you asked me five years ago, would Bitcoin be where it is today? I would have, I would have said, that's a tale that I don't think we're going to see. But, but we're there. Okay. It's pretty remarkable. Why don't you save us from, he's going to walk off the set. Well, we're running out of time, Tom, so we only have about five more minutes left with you, Jay. So let's talk about what's happening here. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing take place is the process of debanking, a phrase that I think Jim said he didn't like this morning, but it's a phrase a lot of people use. As places like this take on more of that business, mm -hmm. at what point does a place like this pose the same risk as a bank and needs to be regulated as such? How close are we to that moment? I don't, I don't think we're very close at all. For, first of all, I don't think we're, we're experiencing, quote, debanking. You know, banks are and will remain at the center of our financial system. Okay? It, you know, th th there's no doubt about it. They, they have the customers. They, they provide you know, the, the vast majority of the credit. But what, what do places like this do? At the margins, they provide a great deal of credit. And that, that additional credit source that places like Apollo and others have provided, I think has been a great stabilizing effect on the economy as we've gone through this transition. When, when you have more nimble credit, you have a better functioning economy. So how many calls do you get from regulators, current regulators that are saying, just want to check in, you still feel that way? Everything okay, copacetic? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and, and look, coming out of, coming out of Dodd-Frank, let's just say we have a credit-based global economy. There is no doubt about it. Global credit, let's just call it 100, okay? We, we said coming out of Dodd-Frank globally, we're gonna take the portion of that that's banking, let's just say it was 70. We're gonna shrink it. Okay, where's that credit gonna come from? If you shrink that 70 to 60, you gotta get 10 from somewhere else. And, and I think people have stepped in and, and we should recognize that that's what happened. Well, and a lot of people would say that, especially with March and what happened there, mm -hmm. a lot of uh, private investment firms did step in and they took on portfolios of loans and they helped some of those banks avoid defaulting. The question is just, we haven't been through another cycle where private credit has taken on this much mm -hmm. of the banking sector. And so there's a question, are there stress tests? Are there things that you see sort of de developing to avoid bad actors that some people say could be out there? There's, there's, there's plenty of stress testing going on here. And it's the kind of question that we ask all the time. And if you look at, if you look at the portfolio, the Athene portfolio, it's transparent. People can see it and the like, which is pretty. Um, pretty. But to Jonathan's question about about banking, it's not banking. We're not engaged in liquidity transformation. We're not. We're not, we're not borrowing short and lending long. You know, bar, we have a match duration, and that's very important. And, and look, regulators should ask that. They should say what is going on in this in this ecosystem. But it's not highly levered, and it's not liquidity transformation. Let's talk about that word leverage. Mm -hmm. This is kind of an odd cycle where it seems like the only place that I can think of that has levered up is the US government. <laughs> where has the leverage been building elsewhere? Uh, is, is, you know, I ask myself that question all the time. I used to sit on the FSOC, you ask about regulators. It's like, where do you have hidden leverage? Where do you have liquidity transformation? And where, where if you had an asset reset, are you gonna have a real problem? And, and what, is, what is remarkable about this is as you look across the economy, the, the place with the increased leverage government balance sheets. Governments have really taken on the, the, the increased leverage resulting from the fiscal stimulus. Fulkerts Landau predicted that really way back at the beginning of this. He said that's where you're going to see it in 2023. You do wonder how problematic that's going to be. Now, there might be some people screaming at the TV this morning saying commercial real estate, commercial real estate. So commercial real estate? You, you know, commercial real estate, of course, and people have looked at it. One of the interesting things about commercial real estate over time, and I don't, I don't want to be too, too bullish, but people have managed to work out price dislocation in commercial real estate time and time again without what I would say a cascading effect. We watch it closely. It clears. We, it clears. It clears. Plain and simple. There are related is rumored to have bought an SL Green property in the last 24 hours down on Madison Avenue. And we make them, yeah, we make the mistake of, you know, we have recency bias and the like. We make the mistake of, of equating the home mortgage market to other markets. It's, it's a market that's very difficult to clear. Jay, it's good to see you. Yeah. This wasn't that painful. It's more painful when you're still the SEC chairman, I think, Tom. Oh, yeah. You've got to answer these questions on. People are more interested, though. No <laughs> you have no idea how we were in awe of people like Jay Clayton. He went in the kitchen when he was a kid and opened up a cupboard, and it was a wall just of Hershey's pouring Kisses. Out. Just pouring out. Just pouring just out. swimming <laughs> in the Hershey's. I'm, I'm still recovering, Tom. Jay, thank you. <laughs> so am I. You, Jay. Jay Clayton, the former SEC chairman and Apollo independent chair. Coming up very shortly, a conversation you do not want to miss. It's Mark Rowan, the Apollo CEO. From New York City this morning, good morning. Equity's a little bit softer. This is Bloomberg.
If last month's Fed meeting was really about the market had done the work for the Fed, this month's meeting is going to be about, well, the market undid all that work. They have a perception issue with Main Street versus Wall Street and making sure that inflation expectations are anchored. The market has a decent chance of slowing down next year. Does it mean it's a massive crash? No, not necessarily. Our view still is for a soft landing, and I think that's the challenge for equity assets in particular. It's not going to be all Goldilocks. It's not going to be easy, but we do think that there is a path for inflation to continue to come down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from Apollo Global Management, live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio. Alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Your equity market on the S&P 500, slightly softer this morning, down by 0.4%. No Fed speak this week. We've saved that for you for next week. The Federal Reserve Chair and Chairman Powell and that Federal Reserve decision is just around the corner. Before we get there, tons of economic data to talk about. TK pushing forward to payrolls on Friday. The headline of the previous hour on this program, this house thinks the Fed put its back. Well, the Fed puts back, and that's the optimism that there. And part of that is a more quiescent job market. And what's important is Torsten Slock double framing Thursday into Friday, and it's asymmetric. He sees a lot of data out there that shows finally a job slowdown against maybe claims still in nirvana. So the Fed put us back. Let's talk about what that means. Because on one hand, that could mean, OK, the Fed will rescue any potential dip. But then we heard from Torsten Slock that we don't need a Fed put, that there isn't enough weakness to get the Fed engaged. And that's why you're going to get higher rates for longer, because we have gotten this resilience, which raises this real question. When does it start to bite more? If we've got long and variable lags and we're on a 10 year lag in two years, are we going to feel the, the uh, effects of these higher rates for uh, perhaps in a more significant way? It's awesome them really pushing back. We gave them a couple of stats. We talked about the record Black Friday shopping online, of course, record Cyber Monday, busiest day on record in U.S. airports. And then we got straight to the big issues underpinning it all. Buy now, pay later. Booming TK over the last 12 months. And the pushback is what's more important to you right well, now? How much the consumer spending or how they're spending, Torsten focused on the latter and not the former. How wrong were we into, uh, I don't know, I can't remember, 3.x percent GDP that became 5% third quarter GDP? Are we going to see the same thing again? Maybe at a lower set where people are going 1.8, 1.9, oops, 2.4 or whatever it could be. 5% GDP in the third quarter. Well, and a here we are sitting at the end of 4Q talking about a recession GDP. next year. 189 is the estimate for payrolls on Friday, by the way, for whatever that's worth. Here are the scores this morning. Start with the S&P 500. Put him back yesterday. Again this morning. Just a touch. No drama. We're down about 0.3% on the S&P. Yields come in about two basis points. Your yield on a 10-year maturity, Lisa. 423.18. The economic data we're getting today uh, in about two hours' time. We get our three hours' time. U.S. October jolts report. I think it's going to be interesting to see whether we do see uh, job openings continue to increase. ISM services for November also coming out again. Do we start to see some of the weakness that we're seeing in manufacturing? Today we're going to hear from bank executives, Wells Fargo CEO, Bank of America CEO, as well as a uh, Goldman CFO at the Goldman Sachs U.S. Financial Services Conference. Do they echo what we heard from Walmart? When do we start to hear about a slowdown that we're not seeing it in the sales data and we're not seeing it in a lot of the customer activity? And we get earnings today from a host of smaller companies that I think might be more of an indication of the feeling on Main Street, whatever that may be. And that's the reason why I'm curious about Land's End, J.M. Smucker, peanut butter and jelly. I mean, it's like, how American can you get, right? AutoZone, Dave and & Buster's, which great. unfortunately I've had to host birthdays at, and Toll Brothers. You didn't uh, have so fun at Dave & Buster's? No? The kids had such a good time. Okay. But have you ever been there? Is there a negative correlation between the kids having fun and you having fun? Well, they have a no? bar. <laughs> <laughs> for the parents to sit at, to sort Good of news. offset the experience of, you know, the screaming, loud, flashing lights. All of those earnings still coming up. We are at Apollo <laughs> HQ, and I'm pleased to say that joining us now <clears throat> is Mark Rowan, the CEO. Mark, good morning to you. Good morning, all. Great Thanks. to have Thank you for coming. Great to be here and great to have you with us. So Pleasure. let's just go straight to the top of this conversation. Private markets versus public markets and why you believe the big opportunity right now is in the former and not the latter. Look, we, we've had a sea change, not just over a year, we've had it over 15 years. So much of our public markets are indexed and correlated. 80% of volume S&P 500, 60% of the market ETFs. 100% of our returns this year are from 10 stocks, which constitute 35% of the S&P that traded an average PE of 50. How many of us come in every day looking to buy 50 PE stocks? Not many. 
And I guess what I'm suggesting to you is that if you, public markets, they're so correlated and indexed to interest rates and to money flows that if you actually want alpha, out performance, you need to step away from public markets. And I think that's happening because we're also revisiting the notion of public being safe and private being risky. This is the framework we used to be in. Private meant venture capital, hedge funds, private equity. Now it just means less liquid. Is that not inherently a risk in your mind, liquidity? Well, liquidity is a risk to everyone, but in differing degrees. So if you are a retirement plan or a retirement system, you know your liquidity requirements for the next 10 years. So if you can get paid for illiquidity, why not get paid for illiquidity? If you're a wealthy individual, how many of them need 100% of their money on Tuesday? If they don't, they should get paid for illiquidity. And we're seeing that in the performance data. If you look at the active management, active management has failed to beat the index 85% of the time for 20 years. And I think it's going to get harder, not easier, to beat the index. As more and more of the market is indexed, very little money is left to actually mm -hmm. make up what needs to be done in active management. What is the single operational distinction between Drexel, Burnham, Lambert, and your Apollo? What is the, the micro idea you can give us of then versus now? I'll not just, uh, I'll give you Drexel, I'll give you Lehman Brothers, I'll give you Bear Stearns, I'll give you SVB, I'll give you First Republic. The financial institutions tend to die of one of two causes, heart attack or cancer. Heart attack is funding risk. They borrow short and they lend long. Cancer is the slow addition of poor quality assets, which uh, over time undermine the system. So you look at all of those mm -hmm. firms, all of those had an element of both heart attack and cancer, funding risk as well as asset risk. You look at what we're doing, we are borrow long, borrowed long and lent long. Everything is matched. Everything is in a fund. There is no daily liquid, quarterly liquid money at Apollo. We are ideally situated to take advantage of less liquid assets. We've structured ourselves that way. And then you look at the totality of what we do. Um, equity is a risk business. Equities go up and down every day. You can lose money in public equity. Really? You can lose money in private equity. In the credit business, the vast, vast majority of what we do is private investment grade. Mm -hmm. When I look at the risks out there and to translate it into Nassim Taleb and all the work he did in Quant with Black Swan, what are the tail risks you see right now for private equity? I mean, are you hedged perfectly? Is, is there next to no delta where you feel so comfortable? Or are there actual tail risks at Apollo? I don't think there are tail risks, and I don't think there are tail risks in private equity. I think private equity is a risk-taking activity. But each of the companies, each of the situations is idiosyncratic onto itself. Um, and over time, private equity has proven to be a very good asset class, recognizing that in certain markets you will lose money. Just like in certain public markets, you will lose money. Well, you had a test here with the way interest rates went. You had a four, five, six standard deviation shock. How did your risks perform given the shock of higher rates? The, the, the glide path of that, how was it along the way? Uh, single best year in Apollo's history. Earnings, asset performance, the, our platform, if you think about it, we are around $650 billion of assets under management in our asset management business. $500 billion of that is credit. We generally benefit from rising rates. Yes, on the equity side, some equity will be worth less than it was, but as a general rule for Apollo, credit rates going up is very strong. On the retirement services side of our business, which is the Athene business, just gone through the roof. Athene is up 30% year over year. So I'm going to steal a page from this guy because he's been talking about Ozempic a lot. And honestly, I think that it's important for us to talk about. Are, are you telling me something that no, I need to No, absolutely not. And I just think that that <laughs> you're suggesting that I'm on Ozempic. Please no, continue. I'm not saying that anyone is on Ozempic. We're talking about this as a game changer I want to make that potentially. Clear. <laughs> no one here is on Ozempic and we're not making any, not that there's anything wrong with it. Whatever, let's move on. Here's this question about how much that transforms life expectancy, how much that transforms some of the investment thesis from your perspective and for retirement. Look, o o over time, you would expect improvements in healthcare, improvements in health technology to improve life expectancy, but not by all that much. We tend to find other things that are bad for the human body. <laughs> as, as one thing does not uh, kill us, another thing does. So I, but I would expect the trend to continue. We are, just to be clear, we are not in the insurance business. We are, in, and we are an insurance company that is in the retirement services business. 
We make money by guaranteeing people's retirement, and we earn money by earning more on our assets than we pay out on our liabilities. Very little exposure to longevity or any other what you would consider biometric or typical insurance risk. There's a real question here and a real focus on income, and you've been talking about that, how there is risk in equity, but not necessarily the same type of thing uh, that you see in credit. And we just saw credit outperform private credit outperform private equity pretty meaningfully. Are you going to shift away from private equity more and more and just focus purely on the more credit business? No, this is the answer. But we have to step back and go back to what our business is. Our business at Apollo, and for most people in the alternative asset management industry, we're not in the asset management business. We're in the excess return per unit of risk business. And then I asked myself, where can we get excess return? Well, in equity, we've gotten to 150 billion. Is it going to grow? I think it will grow. Will it grow multiples? I don't think so. I think the nature of the business, if we're true to ourselves of just focusing on excess return, is slower growth. I look at the credit business. The credit business is nearly 500 billion today. We're not relevant. In the scheme and the scale of these markets, 500 billion is not a relevant sentiment. I assure you, when you speak to all the big bank CEOs today, they don't wake up every day wondering what the mighty Apollo is doing. There's a phrase I've used twice already this morning in the last 40 minutes, one hour, debanking. And every time I've used it, I've had pushback around this table. Why don't we like that phrase, debanking? I personally like that phrase. Uh, Jim Zelter will it'll cost me $20 for just saying the word debanking, but I'm happy to pay it. <laughs> uh, I think the world is debanking. And I say it this way. Every economy, every regulatory scheme, credit is tied to GDP. And regulators have only two choices as to where credit comes from. It can come from the banking system or it can come from the investment marketplace. There's no third choice. And everyone around the globe has made a different decision. But if you look at the trend, with the exception of China, everywhere in the world, regulators are favoring investors over banks. That does not mean we're going to see a sun shift. That does not mean the banking business is going out of business. On the margin, though, the growth is going to take place in the investor marketplace rather than in the banking system for good and valid reasons and for regulatory choice, not because the banking system is unsafe. So given that, you said you don't see a lot of upside in terms of growth, tremendous amount of growth in the equity side. You said you're relevant with $500 billion. How big, how relevant could you become? Well, I, I sat next to a senior executive from BlackRock last night at dinner, and they had food in front of them, and I had no food. And I said, how, how big do you have to be to get food in front of you? And he said, $10 trillion. So that's what you're aiming for, $10 trillion? No, is that what you're I, saying? Look, for us, <laughs> for us, this is about excess return per unit of risk. Our business plan calls for a doubling of our business. And at the end of the doubling, liking who we are as a culture, our limiter is not capital raising. Our limiter is not size of AUM. Our limiter is making sure we get excess return per unit risk, so finding assets and making sure we like our culture at the end of the day. Mark, this is great. You're going to stick with us. Mark Rowan, the CEO of Apollo. If you are just joining us, I'll whip through some of the price action for you on the yes. S&P 500 to begin. Equity shaping up as follows. We are pulling back just a touch on the S&P. We're down by 0.4%. Yields coming in a couple of basis points on a 10-year to 4, 23.37. Right. The conversation with Mark will continue in the next hour. Just a programming note. John Zito, the Apollo Deputy CIO of Credit. Matt Nord, the Apollo Co-Head of Equity. And Mark Downing, the COO of Athene. There are tons of of themes to talk about this morning. TK, the next theme we need to talk about is a really delicate issue in the work that Mark's been doing over anti-Semitism in this country. Yeah, it's front and center for a lot of people and a huge number of the surveillance audience. It's not just at the fancy schools, it's nationwide. That conversation is going to continue right here in New York City at Apollo Global Management's headquarters. Looking forward to cover that all through the morning with you. Equity's pulling back just a touch on the S&P 500. No real drama from New York City. Good morning. To us, the Jewish people, the rise of anti-Semitism is a crisis, a five-alarm fire that must be extinguished. No matter what our beliefs, no matter where we stand on the war in Gaza, all of us must condemn anti-Semitism with full-throated clarity wherever we see it before it metastasizes into something even worse. Because right now, that's what Jewish Americans fear most. 
That was Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer there, the nation's highest ranking elected Jewish official speaking from the Senate floor on the rise of anti-Semitism. Live from New York City, from Apollo Global Management Headquarters, good morning to you all. Before we get to that delicate conversation, just an update on some of the price action for you. On the S&P 500, waking up this Tuesday morning, pulling back just a touch by a third of 1% on the S&P 500. Coming in, Tom, a couple of basis points on a 10-year, 423.37. At Apollo Global Management, we welcome all of you uh, right now, Lisa Bramowitz, John Farrell, and myself for a delicate conversation with Mark Rowan, Chief Executive Officer of Apollo. And we all bring to this our childhoods. My childhood was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant grandmother, John after her third scotch, who would talk about how Jews couldn't go to a certain school in Massachusetts. Most of them ended up at Lisa's University of Chicago. That was a different battle. Now there is a new battle, and we address this with Mark Rowan. I am stunned at what I see at these schools, and particularly at your University of Pennsylvania. You've been vocal. What is the dialogue you're having right now with the leadership of University of Pennsylvania as they deal with this new anti-Semitism? Um, there, there's no dialogue with leadership. At the moment, leadership is uh, on their way or in D.C. for a series of congressional hearings. But the underlying culture that permitted this to happen is just so strong. And until there is a moment of self-reflection where we're not dealing with just anti-Semitism, we're dealing with the culture that allowed this to happen, there really is going to be no progress. And to date, there's been no progress. So what is progress, right? Because there's a real question around free speech versus something else. What is the something else that you're looking for some of these universities to target? This is really not a question of free speech. This is a question of favored speech and disfavored speech and a, an institutional psychology and an institutional culture. So there are places where this is modeled and they're getting it right. For instance, University of Chicago. University of Chicago, Chicago is getting it right. They are kicking Penn's butt to be candid. And it's not that hard. The institution has decided that it is institutionally neutral and that the students and professors and other actors on campus are allowed to have opinions and to speak their opinions within respectful ways. Say what you will, say what you want, allow the other side to speak. That is a culture of free speech, a, a culture where you shout people down, where you have 95% of the professor or academia speaking in one way, where you permit violent protests, where students aren't able to go to class because there's boycotts or there's pressure or other things. It's not a culture of free speech. How do you understand the increase in anti-Semitism on the left, which has really polarized, frankly, the Democratic Party and created a lot of uh, sort of soul searching? Look, th this is a long time coming, but I'll start with history. Um, the definition of anti-Semitism, the modern definition, the IRA definition, includes anti-Zionism as a form of anti-Semitism. This got through the Senate, with many of the current senators still there, 99 to 0, including most of the most progressive uh, Democratic senators. So what we've seen is we've seen a shift in the mood of the populace, particularly on university campuses. We live in a culture on these university campuses of simplicity. You are oppressed or you are an oppressor. If you are oppressed, it does not matter what you do, you can do no wrong. If you are an oppressor, facts be damned, it does not matter what you do, you can do no right. In that kind of mindset, it does not surprise me that anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism has taken hold. And if you give historical context, go to the Holocaust. You have dehumanization, you have delegitimization, and then you ultimately have genocide. Now you apply that to anti-Zionism, you have dehumanizing of Israelis and Jews, you have delegitimizing of Israeli and Jews, and now with Hamas's attack, you have the beginnings of killings. It's not that hard to see where we are. What all the, the only thing that's hard is for the left to recognize it. I have been surprised that people have been so surprised by where some of these campuses are at. And I think about the amount of tremendous philanthropy that have come from people like yourself over the years on these campuses. I do wonder why we allowed it to come to this mark, why it got this far, when we've seen this been building for, for years and years and years through a whole generation. The answer, I believe, is a slow build. And it ultimately comes back to governance and leadership. If I speak just about University of Pennsylvania, the governance is actually divided between the faculty and the trustees. Except for the last 25 years, only one of those two groups has been doing their job. And I put myself in the camp that did not do their job. I was a trustee for a long period of time. 
The trustees have a very important role to play in setting the strategic direction of the university, permissible and impermissible. Where we want to go, except it's not a governing body. 47 trustees really can't agree on anything. It's not set up to govern. There's no history of govern. And so in the absence of any leadership, faculty or administration has taken these universities in direction that the alumni do not recognize. When you have a John Huntsman, a Ronald Lauder, a Cliff Asnes, and 7,000 other alumni who, for their own reasons, their own political persuasions, their own belief system, all don't recognize the university that they loved, you have a problem. So first move is to stop donating, I guess. We could disengage, walk away. You seem to be more constructive about the prospect of change here. You think there is a better path ahead. I think the worst thing that can happen to these universities is apathy. Right now, there's not apathy. Donors are engaged. They want change. They love the place. This goes on much longer. I think we will get to apathy. And once we get to apathy, I don't think the universities can recover from this. And unfortunately, all university presidents that I'm aware of, particularly at the University of Pennsylvania, they seek to wait this out. Maybe this will go away. I won't have to deal with right. this. That is actually a loss. They haven't internalized that that's a loss, but that is a loss. There's an understanding there's a woke adjustment going on right now. We see it in Hollywood, the collapse of many Disney movies and others that have certain messages that aren't selling to the public. The FT has an article on uh, your colleagues at BlackRock on ESG and how there's a woke adjustment in ESG. How is this going to adjust the wokeness of these universities? How will it adjust? Look, this is a question ultimately of balance. This is not a question of a pendulum swing all the way back. But right now, these universities are out of balance. And I believe that the trustees, the alumni, and by the way, many of the faculty, if we read Bill Ackman's letter yesterday and the experience I'm having at the University of Pennsylvania is word for word the experience that Bill Ackman is having at Harvard. Professors don't want to be muzzled anymore. They feel that they can't speak out unless they are conforming to the narrative of the university and the resentment is building. All we've done, all I've done, all Bill has done, is given people an opportunity to speak their minds. And guess what? They have a lot to say. Big Let's, election next year. Let's finish on that. Is this going to change how you approach US politics? Who you would endorse for 2024? No. It's not going to change. Do you have a favorite candidate? No. It's hard to believe with 350 million people in this country that we're down to two. Are you disappointed with these two? Personally, I'm disappointed. What is it about these two that you find so disappointing? Look, we, we, are, we, are in the, we have the single best hand of cards anywhere in the world. We have it all. We just play this hand poorly. What does that mean? Think about it. People want to come here. We have an incredible knowledge base. We have abundant energy. We're leaders in technology. We have a massive domestic market. We're the strongest military power. And yet, we have challenges that we have not been mm -hmm. able to, as a result of lack of leadership, as a result of political consensus, to address. We have a retirement crisis. We have a health care crisis. We have a budgetary crisis. We are inconsistent to our allies around the world. We have important decisions to make without weighing in mm -hmm. as to what's going on in Ukraine and what's going on in the Middle East, all of which seems to be caught in a little bit of a morass. Is United Nations experience important for a presidential candidate? United Nations, no. Okay, I was trying to get him to... That was delicate. It was delicate. <laughs> that was delicate. <laughs> that was the sensitive side of it. I thought I responded delicate. <laughs> yeah, I think that was perfect. <laughs> Mark, thank you. Thank, thank you for having you. us. It's good to catch up. Total pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Mark Robin there, the CEO of Apollo. The coverage will continue here at Apollo's global headquarters here in New York City. From New York City, good morning to you all. The price action looks a little bit like this this morning. Equities on the S&P 500, slightly negative, pulling back on the S&P by 0.4%. Yields a little bit lower as well. Live from New York City, good morning. Let's get straight to it. Here's the price action Tuesday morning. Good morning to you all. Pulling back just a touch, slightly negative on the S&P 500. Likewise on the Nasdaq 100, down 0.5% on the Nasdaq, on the S&P off by 0.4. Into the bond market, tons of economic data coming up a little bit later. Job openings and the ISM. 
We'll keep an eye on that. Jobless claims coming up later in the week. And then the big one, payrolls Friday. The estimate at the moment, 189,000 in our survey. The estimate's still pouring in. That number can change. It's drifted a little bit higher over the last couple of days. Yields on a 10-year, 423.18, down two basis points on a two-year, 462. Almost a double-digit basis point move higher yesterday off the back of Lisa, I guess, off the back of nothing, apart from the move on Friday, which was just in totally the opposite direction. It was in response to people getting sober and saying, wait, maybe we priced in too many rate cuts given the fact that the Fed isn't changing their signal and that, frankly, the economy is doing better than a lot of people expected consistently. So it seems like there was a reset. Now we're going to be bouncing around traders' market because there's no Fed speak to guide us. We are in the quiet period going into next week. One of us is more disappointed pointed than the other. Bramo would prefer it, apparently. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not there with her. The Federal Reserve next week, that decision just a week away. Let's finish on foreign exchange. The euro against the dollar looks a little something like this. The euro pulling back just over the last few days in and around 108. So I'll get you some news. We can do that right now. Under surveillance this morning, Israel ramping up military operations further into southern Gaza. The latest from a spokesman for the Israeli Defense Forces saying fighting is now house to house and tunnel to tunnel. In comments from the White House, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan saying the U.S. has laid out the expectations for Israel to avoid civilian deaths and talks to release the remaining hostages held by Hamas continue. A week ago, we were talking about a constructive tone, Lisa, maybe even an extension of a truce. That is not where we're at this morning. And we've heard uh, that part of the reason why there wasn't necessarily an ongoing hostage release was partly because there was, at least this according to the State Department, uh, Hamas did not want some of the hostages who were released to tell their stories. There also is this ongoing focus to limit civilian casualties. An increasing number of horrific pictures are coming out of Gaza. This is the real question. What is going to be the pressure to resume a temporary ceasefire to get the hostages out? And then longer term, who steps in to create some sort of solution well, uh, to a really difficult conflict? That can be the longer term, but it's been a short term week. And what I find fascinating, particularly on radio, just looking at the footage that we showed a war underway. You know, you look at Anzio uh, as they were south of, I believe, above Rome, excuse me. And you look at Anzio as they moved up in World War II. There weren't cameras there with the direct immediate footage of the challenges the Allies had in attacking uh, the Germans at that time. This is a whole new war. This is brand new. And we're living it, little, I wouldn't even say day by day. John, I'd say it's a 12-hour window. To your point, Tom, it's a whole new war. It is brand new. It's only not even two months old. And that's why we've stopped focusing on a different war. And the White House and the administration trying to refocus efforts there as well. The White House warning USA to Ukraine is set to run out by the end of this year. In a letter to congressional leaders, the Office of Management and Budget warning this. We are out of money and nearly out of time. The House Speaker, Mike Johnson, setting up a debate on Capitol Hill, responding, quote, the Biden administration has failed to substantively address any of my conference's legitimate concerns about the lack of a clear strategy in Ukraine. House Republicans have resolved that any national security supplemental package must begin with our own border. So two wars, right, guys? We know where we are on this. On the one side, you've got Israel. There is division within the Democratic Party on how best to provide aid in that war. The other side, you've got a war in Ukraine. There is division within the Republican Party about how to go forward between Republicans and Democrats. We need to address all of this in the new year, on top of potentially big spending cuts as well. You can see we're on a big collision course down in Washington, D.C. So maybe this is the calm before we start worrying about a government shutdown again, January 22nd, I believe, or is that is the one date? of the dates. I, didn't know that. I will go and just uh, double check that. But there's this question around whether there is a bit more coalescing, a meeting of the minds when it comes to the border issues, given the fact that there has been I a wonder, lot of pressure on Democratic governors in particular. John, quickly, I just wonder how much of this is war fatigue from Iraq to Afghanistan, to now two wars that we're in or not in whatever it is, where the American public is finding a new form of isolationism uh, to move forward on. And that's part of this debate. Two big energy shocks, or at least one, and we thought we'd get a second. Yeah. And it hasn't happened. And maybe the surprise of this particular war is that it hasn't spread yet. We all hope it won't. And that crude is still in the 70s, both on Brent and WTI. I Saudi's energy minister warning cuts to oil production can continue past the first quarter of next year. OPEC Plus deepened voluntary cuts to production after a delayed meeting last week, yet oil markets have failed to respond in a meaningful way. Speaking exclusively to Bloomberg, Prince Abdulaziz bin Salman says the cuts will be delivered and there are no concerns about demand. I beg to differ with the pundits or so-called pseudo experts of saying that there is no growth in demand. We see physical growth in demand. 
we see things that are improving. The, even the world economy storyline is not as bad as people are seeing it. But we want to make sure, again, this precautionary approach, which a lot of people are having a problem with me on the, the, this issue of being precautious. I'm not a gambler. I'm not a gambler. I'm not a gambler. Is the message coming out of Saudi Arabia, Tom, at COP28, I believe, over in Dubai? Well, it's going to be interesting to see those themes there. But again, it is a climate conference in the United Arab Emirates on the Arabian or the Persian Gulf, however you want to call it. So, you know, this is different than having a climate conference pick your city. There's something unique going on in Dubai. We're going to look into that right now. She is in Dubai and not at her Apollo Global Management. Olivia Wassner joins us now, head of sustainable investing for Apollo again from COP28. Olivia, thank you so much for joining us. A big splash in the FT is they really go after ESG and say, is this all going to work out? And part of it, and this goes to the investment of Apollo in sustainable investing, it's you can make money at ESG. You can make money and profit with sustainable investing. Is that what Apollo's witnessed with your investments? Have you seen money being made by being sustainable, by doing the things COP28 is talking about? Absolutely. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me in from Dubai and from COP28. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here and, and also be able to beam into Apollo this morning. Um, absolutely, that is what we are seeing with our investments. So if we look at the capital we have put to work over the last five years into sustainable investing themes, the firm on a whole has put about $31 billion to work. And that was really across the entire platform. That was in real estate, that was in infrastructure, that was in credit, that was in private equity. And, and all of these deals were done in, in regular funds. These were done in funds that had return targets. And we saw great opportunities to make money for our investors, to meet the return targets of the funds, while also investing in businesses and in products and projects that are actually very much contributing to the clean transition, the energy transition, how we think about sustainable resource use going forward. Olivia, if you look at COP28 and on to 29 and 30, are the financial discussions of Apollo and other good and worthies, the great and the good, if you will, are they being overwhelmed by major polluters, the United States and also China, for example, on coal? Well, so first of all, one of my biggest surprises of COP28 so far has been that it is not all doom and gloom. Um, there is a lot of really good news coming out of COP. You had 120 company, countries uh, commit to tripling the amount of renewable generation uh, by the end of the decade. That, that, that's massive if you think about it. Um, we've had just so many positive announcements around capital going into the transition from all different areas of the world. So one of the things that has really struck me is just the amount of capital that's really being mobilized, the ambitious uh, commitments that folks are, are, are really setting here, and, and how excited everyone is. You know, if you look at historical cops, um, as we think about, you know, 28, 29, 30, um, the makeup of who is here has really changed. So when I was walking around yesterday, you know, instead of seeing just nonprofits and government officials, um, you, you see people from law firms, from investment banks, from asset allocators, asset managers, uh, consulting firms. It really is amazing to me just how many people are here and how many people are really thinking about how does climate finance affect what they do? How does it affect their businesses? What are the opportunities that are coming out of this? You know, both for the financial institutions like Apollo, as well as our corporate partners. Olivia, I've got to be—I've uh, got to be honest. I was surprised also about just the degree of optimism, considering how much pessimism there is around the ability to reduce the increase in the climate by two degrees uh, Celsius. Given that, how much are you looking to invest in things like carbon capture and other measures that go against just simply reducing emissions? Yeah, absolutely. So 
Um, so listen, we have a big challenge ahead of us. And if you look at the amount of capital that needs to be spent you know, over the next 30 years, it, it's massive, right? You know, we're looking at somewhere between five and six trillion dollars a year of capital that needs to be spent. Um, Apollo is very much looking at what we want to do on our end and how we really want to lean into, into financing this transition. Um, so we've set a couple targets for ourselves. We set a target of 50 billion by the end of 2027, and we set a target of 100 billion uh, by the end of 2030. Um, so uh, for us, we're really looking at big numbers into this space. And when you look at what we've done historically, again, 31 billion over the last five years, it, it has been a tremendous amount of capital. And I talk to my peers here. I talk to financial institutions. I, I talk to other folks who are here. And what you're really seeing is there's just so much capital being, uh, really being mobilized here uh, at the corporate level as well. I think the world has realized we do need to decarbonize. And now we're looking at what is the best way to do it and how do we get the right pools of capital into it. Do you feel that people are losing enthusiasm a little bit? We've seen some of the backlash, and Tom was just talking about how there is this rethink. Have you seen any of that backlash in terms of just a halting in institutional enthusiasm? Yeah, I, you know, I, I haven't really. Um, certainly, you know, uh, you read the papers, and it, there, there is there is certainly some backlash. But on a whole, I just think you know, if you look at the quantum of people who are here at the number of businesses, at the number of corporates. I mean, there's just so much really good energy around this event. And folks are really looking at, you know, what can they do? How can they do it? How can they best finance it? Where are the gaps? You know, we've had a lot of discussions over the last couple of days about, about the missing middle, right? How do we get to this scaling up part? You know, there's been a ton of capital that has gone uh, into the venture capital and growth equity part of the value chain. And we've got capital that's gone really into the infrastructure. So when you have fully de-risked investments, but how do we find that part in the middle where you've got, you know, you've got technologies and companies that are proven, uh, that are working, but that just need a little bit of help to kind of get to the next level. Um, we see that both in individual companies um, as well as, you know, it might be corporate carve outs of, of much larger companies. It may be green financings for a larger company. There are so many opportunities here to really help fill that gap. And I'm excited about what Apollo is doing here. I'm also excited about what I'm seeing so many of my peers do here. Olivia, we've got to leave it there. Thanks for jumping in front of a camera for us. Busy day for you over there, I know. Olivia Watson out there, the head of sustainable investing over at Apollo. If you are just joining us, equity shaping up as follows on the S&P 500, pulling back just a little bit. We're negative here by 0.4%. I think 2022 and 2023 two wake-up calls in two different spaces for this effort. I understand there are huge investment opportunities here, but 2022, what did we highlight? Just how fragile energy supplies were in specific parts of the world, Europe, and how we'd neglected to invest in fossil fuels in a sufficient way to make sure we were insulated from that, and the prospect of moving away from these things too quickly. 2023, I go to EVs. EVs piling up on forecourts, Tom. Sellers are struggling to push them to consumers in America. And we're going to see more of this. Now, the question you've got to ask yourself is, do we need to turn the other way, hit reverse, or slow things down? Which one is it? And arguably at the moment for a lot of people, it's need to move more slowly, moving too quickly, and exposing ourselves to different things. And 2022 is exactly that. Especially given the fact that now the U.S. is producing a record amount of, of, of oil, uh, which really raises that question. But with the EV, it's a good point, especially with China taking the high ground with that. Should we squeeze in? A mover. Yes, I know please. you want to talk about headlines from J.M. Smucker. Yeah. Well, honestly, there is some uh, sort of negative. Full year adjusted earnings per share came in below expectations of a high of 965 versus 985. But they aren't seeing a material impact from Ozempic. <laughs> Weight loss drugs aren't hurting the company. I know. I know. That's, that was, the that was the, okay, That's the headline. That's the headline right, right there. Okay. Nothing I told else you. And then you Come criticized on. me when I said you're the one that's... <laughs>We still have more and more evidence pointing in the direction of the labor market softening. One indicator jobless claims, yes, still good. Okay. But basically everything else is pointing in the direction of what you would expect. It's beginning to look more not like a soft landing or hard landing, but more like a long-term landing. We're waiting <clears throat> more and more and more for any evidence of either a sharp or slowdown or an acceleration.
It's not a soft landing, it's not a hard landing, it's a long-term landing. Torsten Slock there, Chief Economist at Apollo, speaking to us a little bit early this morning. Tons of fun here this morning at Apollo Global HQ. We've already sat down with Mark Rowan and Jim Zouter. A ton more guests to come this morning right here. Let's start with the price action and look to equities. Pulling back just a touch, we're negative on the S&P 500. A little softer to start the week, down another 0.3% on the S&P. Down three basis points on the US 10-year. TK 422.41 on the 10-year. Lots of data. This morning, job openings, we get the ISM as well. Then on to jobless claims later in the week and on to payrolls this Friday. What's going to be amazing here, John, is the idea of what does a 10-year do? A real stasis there, I would say. Do you agree with me? It's been really like last three days stability in the 10-year. No, just three days. If day, you look I over mean, the three days, I think, sure. Yeah. But if you look at the intraday right. moves, we've had well, like 10 basis go to three points days in either direction. The shock stasis. of the nearing jobs <laughs> report. I mean, I, you know, what, what does... Given, given which way we can go on a job report with revisions, do, do we start talking 399 if we get the Zelter put? You'll get a bump. It's like the Greenspan put. Because of UAW. So 189 is the estimate for Friday, Tom. Yeah. You get a bump from UAW. I understand all of that. But let's just say it's 150, excluding that. It's pretty solid, isn't it? 150. Unemployment south of 4%, claims in at around 200K. We've been asking, <clears throat> what's the bigger surprise for markets, an upside surprise or a downside surprise? And right now, I'm not sure, but either way, we were hearing yesterday could be disruptive to equities in particular because we are in this narrow Goldilocks what is it? Long landing? Oh, whatever. It's beginning to look a lot like... Long landings. Long, <laughs> Long landings. Yeah, it's beautiful. That works. Thanks. That works that this was good. Christmas. That was really good. The bet next year, the hope, the dream, is that you get this so-called soft landing. The growth decelerates just a little bit, but not too much. And disinflationary trends continue, and this Federal Reserve will cut. The one thing that's going to spook this and completely mess up the everything rally is bad data. Tom, bad data changes this the game. You. Not all rate cuts are created equally. If you're cutting interest rates because inflation is coming down and growth is okay, great. great. Fantastic news. If you're cutting interest rates because growth is getting absolutely hammered, completely different rate cut that you've got to deal with. It's a bad data, but I'm going to go to where it was an hour ago on nominal GDP. It's the bad data that leans into the way we calculate gross domestic product or gross domestic income. And then also at the same time, the calculation of inflation with the oddities of real estate, the goods deflation that people are talking about. I mean, this to me, uh, going forward, is going to be the key question. At the same time, if we do get good data, is mm. that going to be good news, right? That's really the key question. Bad data is going to be bad news, but is good data going to continue to be good news? Uh, the bad news is investment has failed. Uh, we mentioned uh, earlier the Employment Retirement Income Security Act of 1974 and the summary of that historic legislation is, guess what? Retirement in America has been a train wreck. At Apollo Global Management, they're trying to fix that, and they're doing that with Stephanie uh, Dresser, Chief Client and Product Development Officer, for apologizing to wealth management on how are we going to make money if it doesn't work under traditional means, and that's what she does uh, here at Apollo. You have a ginormous challenge, which is active management has failed, period. 493 passive investment stocks have failed, period. So there's got to be an alternative. Give us a window. You're, you're at a table in Hong Kong or Singapore with a high net worth individual. What's the alternative to the conventional failure? Well, first off, thank you so much for having me here today. And it's, it's great to see all of you. So I was in Hong Kong just last week uh, and speaking to, to many clients and, and different platforms. And look, stepping back, you're, you're right. There's only... 10 companies in the S&P 500 that have generated 90% of, of the return. And in contrast, when you look at the total number of companies globally, nearly 90% are private. So to your point of offering alternatives as part of a portfolio construction, the classic 60-40 model has not served the retiree, has not served to generate the type of long-term financial goals that an individual is looking for. So when we think about alternatives, we, we talk about fixed income replacement, equity replacement, and how real assets can offer that excess return in an in a environment that is challenging let's to meet build, those returns. Let's build on the fact that you are in Hong Kong. Is a lot of money coming still from China into U.S. private markets as a way to diversify out of that region? Look, we, we see our flows coming globally. 
and so, and Asia certainly represents uh, a meaningful share of the of the global flows. In addition to what we're seeing coming from U.S. individuals and and EMEA as well, there's been a big push uh, at some private investment firms to create instruments to give access to retail uh, investors. Is that something that you think is a good call, given that a lot of the investments are long term and a lot of retail investments are short term, easy redemption types of products? Absolutely. The Look, you need to trust managers that can navigate cycles and be disciplined and rigorous in their, their underwriting and the downside protection. The, the benefits to be able to complement a portfolio that has histor historically been either, either daily liquid or frankly very long term in terms of private markets, right now individuals have the ability to access a suite of semi-liquid offerings that with a bit more illiquidity allows that excess return which is critical to build that diversification and allow them the ability to generate the returns that have historically been in the hands of institutions. So if you think about it, the individual right now is meaningfully under allocated to alts in contrast to the allocations that we see with institutions. And the institutions have benefited from those returns and their ability to generate what the retirees need in their plans. Let's talk about a product, Apollo Alignment Alternatives. Can you talk to our audience about what that is and how big that is now? Yeah, so it's a, approaching 15 billion and Apollo Aligned Alternatives allows as a strategy to, uh, to access diversified private markets exposure. So when we think about the equity markets and the volatility and the concentration that we spoke about, uh, the ability to replace a piece of one's equity, public equity exposure with some, a strategy that provides broad private markets exposure is, is very attractive given the challenges we see going forward. What's the mix in that fund at the moment? Institutional, retail, what's the makeup of it? It's both. It's both. Importantly, uh, what we, what we did early on when we looked to develop the global wealth business is we went on a bit of a listening tour to figure out what the challenges were for individuals as they think about adding alts to their portfolios. And we believe this strategy addresses each and every one of, of those uh, areas of focus for individuals. We wanted to create an efficient access point, one that operationally it makes sense and uh, frankly from a, a tax and regulatory perspective. So in, in each instance we, we listened to, to the needs of the mm -hmm. individual and ultimately tailored it in a bespoke way for them. When you listen to them, particularly internationally, how much do they want to participate in American technology? Are they saying, okay, we'll do that. We're going to throw a pot of money into the Apollo portfolio, but can you also buy Microsoft? You know, for, for us, it is diversified across sectors. And when we speak with them, they look to our investment capability. And ultimately, they, they are looking, for the most part, across asset classes and looking in their portfolios to use alternatives as a tool to complement what they're doing by asset class and fixed income and equity in, in their real asset exposure. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, this was great. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Stephanie Drescher there of Apollo. You guys are going to continue through the next hour. I've got to run back to the studio. You're going to miss York. it. I'm going no, to sort of you're just going to have some bacon. Going to run through the you're going to go well, in there. To, okay, let yes. me clarify. I'm going to pass by bacon and all of that stuff and pastries, you know, and then I'm going to run the, to the studio. Well, we're on, and that well, takes about an hour. Yeah. Okay. They're close to 7th <laughs> Avenue, and Mark sprung today, and it's like big breakfast. It's not just egg McMuffins. I mean, they went large here at nice. Apollo today. Look at to Jean Georges around the corner, Tom, Central Park South, just on the corner there, Central Park West. You know, I don't know. Maybe they'll open for breakfast. I don't know that one. <laughs> yeah, of course you don't. <laughs> of course you don't. Coming up in the next hour, we'll catch up with John Zito, the Apollo Deputy CIO of Credit, Matt Nord, the Apollo Co-Head of Equity, and Mike Downing, the COO of Athene. On Bloomberg TV in the following hour, Andrew Slimman, Morgan Stanley, Cameron Dawson, New Edge, Whaley of BlackRock. Whaley coming out with their new outlook. So look out for coverage of that a little bit later on this morning. From New York City, from Apollo Global Management HQ, good morning.
if last month's Fed meeting was really about the market had done the work for the Fed, this month's meeting is going to be about, well, the market undid all that work. They have a perception issue with Main Street versus Wall Street and making sure that inflation expectations are anchored. The market has a decent chance of slowing down next year. Does it mean it's a massive crash? No, not necessarily. Our view still is for a soft landing, and I think that's the challenge for equity assets in particular. It's not going to be all Goldilocks. It's not going to be easy, but we do think that there is a path for inflation to continue to come down. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on radio, on television, on the right side of the tracks. Headline, I've gone below 59th Street for the first time this year oh, yeah. here at Apollo he Global a Management. Welcome jet. all. This has been a joy so far, hasn't it, Lisa? It's been really illuminating, considering <clears throat> the fact that there are these sort of macro trends going on within the industry of shifting to private increasingly, but also this question around yeah. where we are at a moment that's uh, pretty uncertain economically. Yeah, we started strong with Jim Zelder talking about the Greenspan put. It's a Zeltner put is the rename for it. And it goes right into the Friday uh, data here. You know, we're distracted here by finance and credit and investment. Come on, it's an economics week with huge data on Friday. Yeah, we're going to get the payrolls report. Then we're going to get the drumbeat to it with the uh, initial jobless claims on Thursday. ADP on Wednesday, <clears> I know you followed that very closely. You care a whole lot. And then the jolts figure, which you started the show by that's saying, Right? We do get jolts today at 10 a.m. I care. I think it's interesting, especially because Torsten Slock was talking about the quits rate. Fewer people are quitting their jobs. So this is a softening. Does this mean that we're heading toward a downturn or just, I don't know, something that can leave rates where they are for a longer period of time? Our conversation is so important. We're going to get through a quick data check. Lisa's got 14 questions for uh, John Zito here at uh, uh, Apollo. Right now, let me do the data for you here. And what's great with the distraction of this wonderful remote is we've got very quiet uh, markets. SPX off two days in a row off the joy of Friday. Euro hasn't moved since time began. Uh, <laughs> Ten-year yield, 4.22%, giving me no love. And crude, I guess crude is of, of interest with the uh, Amory Horton with us here with an update coming up. But with the incredible difficulties of the Eastern Mediterranean, that's my surprise of 2023. I would have said $98 a barrel. Especially given the fact that Saudi Arabia is pledging additional cuts going forward. Well, that John Freyer interview was something. So it raises this question, is this because we're seeing demand drop off? Is this because of some of the shifts that we're seeing globally with respect to renewable energies? Or is this something else? Maybe trading volumes, maybe something else uh, going forward. Right. But to me, that has been one of the biggest surprises. One more thing to talk about China, and this is the, the almost bipolar nature of it, the service statistic out of China, which I really don't understand, full disclosure, was actually pretty constructive, but grim news on their balance sheet on the property side. And this has been a consistent story. How much is that going to really force their hand to initiate right. some sort of stimulus, which is the reason why they got downgraded, <clears throat> let's be clear. Uh, by Moody's because they are probably going to have to step in and that will affect their fiscal backdrop. Breaking news is 3 p.m. this afternoon. You'll see it. Apollo Global Management buys Shanghai. They're looking for that restructuring here. And someone's going to do damage control uh, shortly. This afternoon. <laughs> Joining us now <laughs> is the control. interview that Bramo has been most, most waiting for. John Zito is deputy CIO of Credit at Apollo. That's an important idea. And just, just the vignette here of taking the loyalty program of Air France KLM and saying we can make this like United or whatever pitch they gave them, they just closed that deal is one example of a transaction. Why don't you bring in handsome John Zito? How brave do you have to be to invest in the airline sector? John Zito, thank you so much for being with us. Deputy CIO of Credit at Apollo. I do want to start there, this idea of direct big investments in specific companies, how hard that's getting to do at a point with pretty high valuations and a questionable outlook going forward. I don't think five years ago many people thought that private credit would be defined as providing private loans to Air France, Venovia, AT&T. I for sure did not think that that would be happening, um, and it's happening pretty quickly. I think what's happening in the market is companies are trying to diversify their funding away from traditional sources. If you have $100 billion of debt, you don't want all of that debt to just be a QCIP bond. Maybe you want some sort of structured solution. Maybe you want something more private. When things get volatile, you want to have tons of options in terms of capitalizing your business. And these businesses are just, with a very small percentage of their overall balance sheet, diversifying their funding. There's almost $2 trillion uh, of uh, investment grade 
debt coming due. Actually, two trillion dollars of high yield debt coming due in the next four years. There's uh, one and a half trillion dollars of investment grade debt coming due. How much do you think is going to get refinanced in the private world? Again, very small percentages would make a dramatic impact on the private markets. Uh, we all have to start defining the private markets in a much broader way. We've all defined it as middle market lending, a $1 trillion marketplace. Um, we define it, as many of my colleagues have talked about this morning, as really a $40 trillion marketplace, mm -hmm. which really exists predominantly in investment grade and anything that's non-traded that sits on a bank or insurance company balance sheet. And when you use that definition and you talk about $2 trillion of refinancings or $3 trillion of refinancings, it's a very small component of the overall capital needs. And again, we're $500 billion. Um, we tend to get a lot of attention when we provide a loan to Air France. Um, but in the context of our overall balance sheet, it's, it's, right. it's actually relatively normal course. Yeah, I want to fold in two ideas here. First of all, and we've seen this so many times in the cycle of global Wall Street, is there a brain drain going on right now in your world from the conventional banks over to the Apollo type institutions and because of that brain drain, do you have a negotiated leg up in looking and reviewing a transaction? Well, most of our investors are retirees or pensions. They have a longer period of time. So when we're talking to a company and we're trying to provide capital to them, it's, it's matched. So it's all about balancing both that commitment from our investors, retirees, and with the needs of the company. Um, when you have that leg up relative to someone who has to provide capital on a very short dated basis, we're just going to be able to, to create much more unique solutions, solutions that fit the company better. Well, I mean, I mean no, with Air France KLM, you got decent discounted hotel rooms in Paris, which <laughs> I don't have, folks, let me tell you right now. We, we, we got a guy for but you. Is that a, is that a duration transaction where you have a leg up because you're looking out, say, 10 years or you tell me perpetuity, 50 years versus a conventional bank? It's worried about a three-year or seven-year rollover. Yeah, with, with that, it was taking a specific asset and structuring it in a way that would tie um, to a very specific pool of capital that was probably not logical for um, the QCIP market. So it was just very specific. And, and in each company, um, each situation is a little different. And you have to have the flexibility of capital to, to provide that to make it work for the company. Have you been surprised that we haven't seen a, a big sort of catastrophic credit event after decades of zero rates that suddenly spiked upward? And here we are. There is everybody warning of Armageddon. Nothing like that happened. Are you surprised? Is there going to be a bill to be paid at some point? Or was this actually exactly the right approach? Well, we regulation worked in a lot of ways. Right? We deleveraged. The banks deleveraged. Um, typically, you have financial crises from either lever you know, some sort of over-levered balance sheet or some sort of um, credit crisis um, where there's, there's actual true losses. Um, the, the system has is, is actually been delevered, generally speaking, and the capital is finding its way, the assets are finding their ways onto the right capital, which is really less levered, investor capital. Um, clearly, uh, we're concerned about certain parts of the economy that probably over-earned during COVID. Um, there are ch very big changes in migration patterns going on in the U.S. where you're going to have parts of the U.S. economy that are going to do much, much worse than other parts like of the what? economy. Um, obviously, South Florida is doing fantastically well. Uh, I'm from Miami, so I'm going to give a little, little shot to Miami. Um, but, but Miami, where you have millions of people moving down there, you look at commercial real estate rates, you look at building, you look at occupancies, you can't find a place to live. Or if you go to places in the Midwest or other places where you've seen migration, uh, people leaving in, in really droves, um, you're going to see a totally different mini economies. And we look at economic data at the U.S. level and we, we don't, we never break down the data in specific, uh, specific microclimates. Uh, I think you're going to see microclimates climates pop up as, as you have structural changes from, from all these, from the post-COVID world. I'm looking right now at just how much yields have risen uh, for a lot of companies. Most companies are not paying this, right? And we keep talking about this, the idea that maybe the uh, headline number is 8.5% for high-yield public markets. But in reality, people are still paying 4 to 5%. When does it become punitive? What's the rate at which you start to wonder whether it's worth charging a company based on their viability going forward, their ability to keep existing and pay you back? Yeah. Um We've, we've raised 120, we went from 125 trillion of total debt to 250 trillion of total debt in the last 15 years. Um, clearly higher interest rates are gonna impact some companies that either took on too much le leverage or their business is more cyclical. And when we go through a slowdown, they end up having too much debt. So they'll need either equity capital 
they'll need to pick interest or they'll need some sort of structured solution to, to make their, their balance sheet work. I suspect defaults will, will go mm -hmm. up. Um, I suspect there'll be losses in certain sectors, um, just like any other cycle. I think the, the common lens is to look at the last cycle and say that's where all the problems are gonna be, which is housing or banks. I actually think both those asset classes are, are in, pretty, in pretty good form from right. a credit perspective. There's other things that really assumed in interest rates would be zero forever. And now they're going to have to live with those capital structures. And I suspect there's, that's where you're going to see the core of the problem. Okay, so I, I understand everything's perfect at Apollo. That's the act. But well, the answer is there's shadows out there. Which is the shadow you're most worried about? Um, again, I think there were certain parts of, of infrastructure that assumed that rates would be zero forever. And then they built oh, the so capital LaGuardia structures. So LaGuardia is going under? LaGuardia is definitely not going under. Um, but I would say Beautiful. there's certain parts of the capital structure where you just have too much debt. And when that debt has to roll. Okay, give us some color on that. You know, nobody's watching. Is it the car companies? Is it tech companies? Is it? Yeah, we, we need to bury somebody here. Today. <laughs> it's a tradition. Yeah, You're so, the chosen one. So, yeah, so um, I would say, generally speaking, Anybody who assumed that interest rates would be zero oh, and they have to roll their debt, yeah, he's we're not going to go into it. He went to the Zeltner School of Charm. I got I nothing mean, out of this. Yeah, it's like specific names that you're going to end up. Yeah. Put a hook John on. Zito, thank you so much. Thanks, really guys. appreciate it. How about Zito, those dolphins? Deputy How about those CIO dolphins? of credit at Apollo. And I, you know, look, Don't leave now. We're still on air. We're still on air. He's like, please. first time. Yeah, Hira, do something. No, but this is really the key question, right? How do you pinpoint who's going to have a hard time and who isn't. Because right now, it's not a default cycle like we got used to you never back see in 2008. I'm, I'm, I'm in the camp. You just never see it coming. You, you can think as hard as you can with the smart people here, and you always get wrong what the surprise is down the road. And this year, the surprise has been that we did not get the recession, right. and we didn't get the shadows that everybody thought were in the works. We're here right now with the Standard & Poor's 500 down three-tenths of a percent. I will just say, I'm actually really interested in Smuckers. I know this is crazy, but I'm really curious about all of these uh, smaller companies and what they're actually saying. They aren't seeing a significant impact from Ozempic and weight loss drugs. We talked about that earlier. But the fact that they see net sales coming down, the fact that they see full year adjusted EPS coming down, the fact that they've got free cash flow coming <clears throat> down. I'm missing it. Come on. Come on, you're, you're upset me. Mark Rowan called me up and he said, look, because we're doing this the same day as Smucker's earnings, we're having Twinkies here at Apollo Global Management. The news was Smucker's, Orville, Ohio. It's as stodgy as they come. And the answer is they did a bolt-on transaction. It could have been financed by Apollo Global Management and they bought Hostess. So you got a bolt-on now of, think of this, you got, <laughs> you got Twinkies. Zeno's entourage is over here, they, you know, they're killing me. You got Twinkies <laughs> and orange marmalade. Think of the, think oh of the possibilities. Oh my God, Tang, orange marmalade and tang. Twinkies is no. literally the worst thing. You, what are you trying to do in the morning for people at breakfast? They've got this beautiful <clears throat> breakfast over here talking about <laughs> Twinkies and orange marmalade. Well, Jam Smucker is up 3.2%. But, but to me, these are some of the interesting earnings to you're watch. You're correct. Se what's serious here, Lisa? <laughs> is these stocks have been not participating. Exactly. Liz Ann Saunders Thank at Schwab's you. done some great stuff on this. And you just wonder, you wonder seriously, uh, what, what they're going to be. We're going to talk equity here at Apollo. They do equity here at Apollo. Uh, and we'll see how that goes with Matt Nord and Mike Downing. But coming up as well, Anne-Marie Hordern in Washington, John Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen from the offices of Apollo Global Management. Good morning. Is this going to change how you approach U.S. politics, who you would endorse for 2024? No, it's not going to change. Do you have a favorite candidate? No. It's hard to believe with 350 million people in this country that we're down to two. Are you disappointed with these two? Personally, I'm disappointed. Mark Rowan, Apollo CEO, with a non-answer there to John Farrow on the presidential election coming up.
but a really important conversation, not only, Lisa, on the work here, his vision here for his Apollo Global Management, but also a very delicate conversation on the anti-Semitism that we're seeing at his University of Pennsylvania. Although what he did say about the political uh, backdrop heading into next year was really interesting, this disappointment that he feels about the two candidates who are going to be in the running, saying, can't we do better? And he's not alone with that. I think it's really interesting to hear increasing calls for Chris Christie uh, and even Ron DeSantis to drop out to coalesce around Nikki Haley as people are saying, who yeah. could possibly run against the former President Trump? And likewise, on the Democratic side, this is really an interesting moment where everyone assumes this will be the race, and yet people are trying to chip away at it around the edges. And, and, I, and I get out the idea of the calendar coming into this wonderful building. There's an iconic uh, Christmas decoration that they have here. Uh, if it falls over, it's going to kill you. It's, uh, it's a you know, candy cane kind of thing here at this claimed uh, building, the old Bank of America building. And the answer is, uh, Lisa, the calendars move in, and the calendar for Chris Christie and others like Mr. DeSantis is moving in real time to January 22nd or 23rd. Yeah, I mean, this is going to be, uh, honestly, an evolution. <clears throat> and the big existential question hanging over it is, are we going to still end up yeah. with a Trump versus Biden kind of race? Quieter markets today as we wait for the economic data. Jolts comes out at some point. McKee all over that. Ten-year yield in three basis points, 4.22%. Uh, Future's a little soggy, but... I'm sorry, you know, it's economics, finance, investment. Guess what? Right now, it's all about the economics of Friday. And can we continue with the Goldilocks discussion, given how far we've gone? <clears throat> all I can say is it's kind of the hangover after last month. Last month was really amazing yeah. as far as uh, annual yeah. returns for a month. And basically, this is the hangover. You know, I can't wait. take the bait on that. <laughs> Joining us now with the hangover I was is hoping a Christmas maybe party you would. start in Washington, <laughs> uh, D.C. Bloomberg Christmas party correspondent. <laughs> Anne Marie Horton. Anne Marie, you I, know, I, know. I, I look at what's going on here. Uh, <laughs> thank you. I am, but that's one of us. I, I look at Anne Marie Horton at where we are now, and it's completely clouded by a war that has become on the edge of chaos. And as I mentioned earlier, Anne Marie, on a 12 hour basis, we really don't know what's going on. Describe in Washington the frantic nature of the study of the war in the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, to your point, Tom, it's uh, changing rapidly. We thought that potentially that pause that we had, that 10-day pause, that that truce at the moment to exchange hostages and, and prisoners and get humanitarian aid, it could potentially be elongated and there would be more hostages that would come out. We heard from Jake Selvin, the president's national security advisor, yesterday talking about the fact that uh, this cratered because of Hamas and the State Department saying that Hamas didn't want to give up the remaining um, women that they had control over. So now what you see is Israel really going into the South and the debate that's taking place here in Washington, D.C., and there will be an intelligence briefing on Capitol Hill today in the Senate, not just to discuss Israel, but also zooming in will be Volodymyr Zelensky, mm -hmm. the Ukrainian president. So Ukraine will be top of the agenda as well. But the debate surrounding all of this aid is really two things. And within the Democratic Party, is, is there going to be strings attached to aid to Israel? We've talked about it time and time again, this pushback from some of the progressives about how Israel conducts this war in Gaza. And then, of course, when it comes to Ukraine, for Republicans to sign up to that and not filibuster this or not vote this down, they want to see strictum, stricter laws and stricter um, uh, uh, asylum laws, parole laws, and more funding towards the U.S. southern border. When the administration speaks to Israel under war, who do they speak to? Is it just about Mr. Netanyahu, or is it more complex than that? I think it's more complex than that. Look, we've had um, Bill Burns in Qatar for days or weeks. Um, he's been, of course, the U.S. top diplomat, but really invoking himself into this crisis because his uh, co uh, counterpart is the head of Mossad. And we've also seen that individual go in and out of Qatar. Um, so there are different individuals depending on what is happening on the ground, what the U.S. wants to see done, that they will reach out to and, ta and talk to. It's really been counterpart to counterpart. I also think, you know, when we had Secretary of State Antony Blinken there for his third trip to the region since October 7th, um, he spoke to the entire Israeli war cabinet. So it's not just 
Prime Minister Netanyahu, who, of course, the president continues to remain in touch with, and there's been a number of phone calls throughout the weeks. But um, it's a larger apparatus uh, with all of these individuals, whether it's the head of the IDF, head of Mossad, or head of the government. And Marie, we talked about Ukraine aid and how the president has really pushed forward this idea that we're running out of time and that money will run out for that effort by the end of the year. How closely tied is it being uh, sort of paired with the idea of border uh, security, securing the border for the United States? And how much Democratic support is there at a time where states like New York and Connecticut have increasingly felt that pressure? So two things. I think these things are definitely linked. The president when he talked about this package and asked Congress for this package, had all of these priorities linked. The U.S. southern border, Ukraine, Israel, and strategic partners in the Indo-Pacific. For Republicans, though, to really be able to sign up for it, though, because we have seen divisions within the Republican Party on Ukraine, and even those hawks, defense hawks, that want to see money to Kiev, recognize that they're going to have to make sure that they're going back to their constituents and also bring in other members of their Republican Party with not just funding on the southern border, but a lot of this is coming down to policy, and that's why the talks broke down over the weekend. But Chris Murphy, a senator from Connecticut, um, who is really a part of these negotiations and integral to them, said, you know, there's some things on here that no Democrat would vote for. So they need to get that language correct. But to your point, Lisa, there is pressure on Democrats to make sure that they are delivering something tough and substantial when it comes to the southern border, because we've seen the letters from the likes of Governor Pritzker. We've seen the outrage from Mayor Eric Adams of New York and Governor Kathy Hochul, who say that they need more support if they're taking in more of these migrants. How much do you see the Senate sort of taking the lead from the House when it comes to these sort of border uh, debates, given the fact that there have been questions about leadership and how strong it is in the House and that the Senate has been so quiet amid all of that turmoil? Well, all of these conversations at the moment are happening on both sides of the Capitol in both chambers. But you're right. The Senate is taking the lead on this. This is where the deal will be done. Um, you also see the Senate have strong support in their Republican leaders for the likes of aid to Ukraine, which Shalonda Young yesterday sent a letter to Congress saying, time is running out. There is no extra pot at the end of the year that we can draw down from, and we will kneecap our partner in Ukraine uh, at the hands of Putin if we do not send them funds. The likes of Senator Mitch McConnell went on a tour, really, talking to the press about how actually this builds up the U.S. industrial base, and this means jobs, say, in Alabama, trying to explain what this money actually means. So that deal is going to be cut in the Senate, and this is why you see a lot of these Republican senators talking about tougher asylum provisions, because they want to make sure that the Republican colleagues in the House can pass it and get it through. When it comes to the House, for them, really, I think one of the top priorities is making sure that they do not shut the government down. Uh, that's going to be the next debate come January for the first part of that tranche of this two-laddered approach to the continuing resolution. Um, but yeah, it's a little been messy, to say the least, in the House. I mean, last week they ousted a member of their own party, and they have an even slimmer majority now. All right. Amory, thank you so much. Amory Horton, our Bloomberg Washington correspondent here, uh, with a battle in the eastern Mediterranean coloring all of the discussion in Washington. Yeah, well, right now there's also the geopolitics that really have overshadowed a lot of the domestic haggling. And I think about what's going on with the two wars that we were just touching on, but also the oil backdrop. I think that that's kind of interesting right now. Well, the oil backdrop's there in a headline out uh, in the recent minutes here that Mr. Putin will meet with the leadership of Saudi Arabia of some form. I don't have that in front of me. But that just shows you the world goes on, the travel goes on away from war. Well, this is going to be Vladimir Putin's first foray outside of right. this country. He right. said, said to be meeting with Saudi Crown Prince during his visit, you, according to the Kremlin. Did you notice that people here at Apollo Global Management get in at the crack of 8.30? Did you notice that? <laughs> That's called life, Tom, it's outside just, of I our bubble. Go, I'm going private equity. Good morning from Apollo Global Management. Bloomberg Surveillance.
Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow at the Breakfast Bar here at Apollo Global Management. We are here, Lisa Bramlett and I, working away That's as right. John Eat chows bacon. down. A wonderful visit here. We've got it we finish very strong here. Matt Nord and Mike Downing uh, to be with us here. Zelda said Athena is like the biggest thing here. Yeah, I mean, huge we're finishing revenues. strong here uh, with that. But, you know, right now we're looking at some economic data and. You know, forget about all this fancy finance talk. Friday matters. Well, yeah, Friday matters, but so too 10 a.m. when we get jolts, which I know you're so excited about, as well as ISM services. Actually, ISM services, we haven't talked about enough. We continue to see the decline, the recession in manufacturing offset by services. Can that continue? Dun, I agree dun, it's uh, a mystery. I agree, yeah. I agree it's a huge mystery. There's a great Wall Street Journal chart is showing outright goods deflation. A lot of people have predicted that, and that's part of the disinflationary story. But, like, the mystery of, of services in the United States has got to be front and center into the Q4 guesstimates. So then we get initial jobless claims, which is going to be big. ADP on Wednesday, which no one cares about until they do. I keep right. saying that because it's true. Everyone's like, Ugh, no one even understands yeah, the correlation. The you know, and I then, understand. you know, it comes out in a surprise number, and people... Get We're going to do the data check. The markets are open. Okay, that's the data check. <laughs> well, uh, this morning, it's, it's sort of quiet out there. Yields are in a little bit as well. Let's go to Michael McKee, who will save the moment economically as well. Michael McKee, Torsten Slack of Apollo Global Management, makes very clear this is a dual jobs report. The importance of the claims report Thursday rolling into the jobs report Friday. Are they linked in any way? Well, they're not specifically linked because one measures job losses and one measures job gains, but they are in the sense that if we're seeing more job losses, then theoretically job gains go down. Also, the fact that continuing claims have been the focus in recent weeks as they've been higher, uh, that suggests people are having a harder time getting jobs, which should lead into the JOLTS report showing fewer job openings. But that's kind of uh, neither here nor there because the JOLTS numbers expected at this point to show, uh, and that comes out at 10 o'clock today, that we're still well over 9 million job openings. So uh, the labor market, is it tight or not? We'll have a pretty good idea by the end of the week whether it's changed in the last month. We've talked a lot about the labor market, Mike. We haven't really talked about services, and I think it's important, especially given the record send spending online, given the fact that we see record amounts of travel over the Thanksgiving break. How much are you expecting to see that strength continue versus signs of weakening? It looks like at this point there's a little bit of a mixed picture coming. The forecast is for the ISM services index to go up a little bit to show a little more strength, which would be interesting given what you were saying earlier about manufacturing staying in a recessionary territory. But new orders are supposed to come down. They still all remain high. Uh, still in the 50s, still showing expansion. So it's hard to tell exactly what it's going to tell us, but it is also going to be interesting to see what happens with prices paid because they're expected to fall. If service industries are expanding and the prices they charge are not going up by as much, then that's good news for the Fed. Right. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Look forward to it. Seriously, the JOLTS report coming out here. And then on we go to the labor economy of America, where we'll be at 8.32 on Friday is a mystery. Uh, uh, Farrell came to talk to Rowan. You came to talk to Zelt. I don't give a damn about any of them. I just want to talk to Matt Nord, uh, who's co-head of equity here at Apollo, who has the coolest board membership as well. And Lisa, I'm going to go back 54 years, sitting in David Eddy's basement, and there was an album out that Jimmy Page produced. It cost $31,000 or something at the time, and it was your Led Zeppelin. You're a, you're a board member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, most important institution in America. And, and there was Zeppelin inventing it in 1969. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it's great to uh, you didn't be here with this, you. Did you? No. Well, I'm happy to talk about it. Uh, you know, we, we like to have fun at Apollo. And uh, I'll take physical graffiti if that's okay. Okay. Yeah. It's very, you know, we, we, we look at that, and that's a time here. And the time of private equity is a lot, lot less. It's not 54 years. It's happening in real time and rapidly. Where's private equity going to be? at Apollo and as an industry in five years. So I'm tremendously excited about the outlook for our private equity business. Uh, all of Apollo is growing and performing well. PE is, continues to be a really important part of our business. So if you look at what we've been able to achieve recently, we closed Fund 10 over the summer, $20 billion in commitments. And if you look at Fund 9, it's appreciate 16% year to date. That's on top of 23% 
last How'd year. How'd you do that without opening warrants. Apple? How'd you make 16% without owning S&P 500 or Apple or sure. Microsoft or NVIDIA? So what we try to do is find the best risk reward across any market environment. We're not timing a particular market. And so we'll pivot depending upon where we see the best opportunities. And our job ultimately is to buy good companies, capitalize them well, and put these management teams in a position to be successful. And then once we close on these deals, we're generating increased earnings growth, free cash flow generation. And so this is meant to work across all market environments. Are you losing customers to private credit? Well, I think the question, if you're competing for allocations of capital, is what differentiates you? So coming out of the environment that we've been in, in a bull market, it, everyone worked, right? Everyone made money. In this environment, do you have the tools to generate returns with this sort of uncertainty? And because we've been together for such a long time, we've done this for 30 years, and we have that ability to pivot, we've continued to demonstrate and receive really good support from our investors. What kind of returns are people looking for to justify the risk that is bigger in equity? So I, I think that's a really important question because we always think about where is their excise or outsize return per unit of risk, right? Where are you getting compensated? And if you're willing to take levered equity risk today with the outlook for rates, the outlook for the economy, I think you need to generate mid-20s rates of return and do it with really conservative assumptions. So what's the leverage ratio there? I mean, you know, it's not 1998. Don't tell me you're doing 20 to 1. But what kind of, I mean, could it be triple leveraged? I think <laughs> Stop so. getting so excited. What kind of leverage <laughs> do you have to have to make those returns work? Well, I, I think it starts with purchase price. So typically, we're buying assets at around six or seven times EBITDA. That's the purchase multiple. And when you're buying well, you're using less <clears> leverage. Okay. We're only leveraging companies around three or four times. Pro tip, are you going to buy Hollywood? What a mess out there right now. What are you going to do about the mess and how you talk about EBITDA? I don't think Iger can count the EBITDA right now. What's the opportunity in American entertainment after the train wreck of the last 24 months? When we think about portfolio construction, we're not targeting a particular industry. We really just want to be bottoms up and find the best risk reward. So if we can buy good companies, good cash flow, we don't need to make bets around disintermediation so or otherwise. A, a recent transaction. Right. Give us a recent so, transaction. So we've been incredibly active this year. And if you look at Fund 10, which is our most recent fund, we did the take private of Arconic, which is an aluminum fabrication business, uh, Univar, and chemicals distribution business. These are sectors that we have followed for years. So our partners cover sectors, and particularly a lot of take private transactions. Right. I think CEOs are kind of, they've woken up to the fact that private equity is the long-term money. I think there is this perception that private equity is the short-term money, but your ability to invest for the long-term is really enhanced with private equity. Okay, this, this, go ahead, Lisa, please. please I was please, just going to say, how much is the idea of not having to sell fortifying this idea that maybe there aren't losses even when there are losses? In other words, how much is sort of a fiction of not having to price in real time, even at a time where there's a lot of price destruction? I think that's a little bit more of an issue for the industry, less for us. I think a lot of sponsors overpaid for assets the last couple of years. And the air is very slowly coming out of that balloon. And so I think you can question some of the private market valuation multiples. Again, for us, buying at six times, we tend to see multiple expansion when we sell it. So I, I don't have that concern for our business. Are you investing in non-profitable tech? No, that's, that's not for us. Okay. We like <laughs> cash flow. We like cash on cash <clears throat> returns. Uh, we're very happy with our model. So give it, just for, for our audience, which is fascinated by this, you're coming in at six times EBITDA, down the income statement, some right. form of balance sheet construction. How long is your expected duration on a blended basis to where you take that out? At what level of EBITDA? Are you going from six to nine? Or are you trying to pop this thing with leverage out to 12 times EBITDA when you exit? No, so we're entering to conservative assumptions. What we want to do is return capital along the way. So the average hold may be four or five years, but I think this is one of the biggest issues for the industry is how much capital has been returned. And for these sponsors right. that have overpaid for assets and over levered, it's very hard to generate returns. For us, if you look at Fund 9, we've already returned about $10 billion of capital. We've already returned about half of our invested cost basis, which is best in class for that vintage. So it's another benefit of buying well. So we've taken companies public, we sold assets, <coughs> We have right. a lot more flexibility. Well, in the shadow of Charlie Munger, with all that we've studied of him in the last week and the death of the giant, I mean, what it comes down to is you're getting a preferred cash flow along the way. Correct. Give us a number on that. Are you picking up, 
you know, not over LIBOR, but over a conventional buyback dividend, are you picking up another 300 basis points off that? It's a great question. So when we target our returns, let's say 25% base case returns, we're typically underwriting to about 10 to 15% cash on cash yield in the first year. And then earnings growth, and then we have a team of operating partners that can help you know, really drive further value creation from there, but it starts with that cash flow yield. How I'm going to tear up here. <laughs> I, just, I can't much? tell you the last time somebody said, yeah, we could do 25% a year. How much <laughs> are you seeing fee compression? Sure. Um, we haven't seen it in our flagship private equity business, but I do think that when you have a platform such as ours and you have more sophisticated investors, it makes for a more dynamic relationship where we can really have platform to platform relationships and there are synergies across the entire platform. How much are you counting on the capital markets opening up to be able to exit in order to continue returning capital in the same kind of way? So, uh, you know, again, with less leverage, we have lots of flexibility. I think the IPO markets will be a little bit stronger in 24. Right. It'll be hard to be worse uh, than, than 23, <clears throat> uh, but we're not counting on that. And so, Having all these different levers, we're engaging in a number of conversations right now around selling right. assets. I think we have different pathways. I'd love to know what you think after this wonderful discussion about duration and patience, about CTAs running around with their heads cut off, trying to make swings in the market. I mean, we've got a hedge fund industry right now basically day trading from what I can tell. What are you treasuries. I mean, I mean, by definition, it's alpha destruction. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, for, for us, it's really about long-term value creation. We're not market timers. You know, this team has worked together for a long time. We've been doing this for 30 plus years. My partner, David Samber, and I have been here for 20 yeah. years. And this is a model that is focused on discipline, downside right. protection, strong returns across well, all our market environments. That, that's where we're We're out of time, but thank you so much for pretty Bertie thank Taupin you. in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame <laughs> right. with Tumbleweed Connection, greatest album of all time. I appreciate the time. Thank, <laughs> thanks so thank much. You. Matt Nord right. of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with us here. <laughs> and Apollo. And Apollo Global, and Apollo. <laughs> and Apollo and Global Management uh, as well. If you are just joining us, uh, let's just take a quick look at the scores, which aren't that great today. We just are, really haven't seen much in terms of market yeah. action. A little bit of softness, though. S&P lower by three-tenths of a percent, 45.63. It's going to be interesting to see here. You know, we, we gave Mike McKee short shrift here because we want to talk to Matt Nord. But the bottom line is it is an economic week. We can't forget that. And let us, you know, just talking to Torsten Slock, it's fascinating to me. Is this the jobs report where we have a negative whisper number? or a tilt below whatever the number is, 180,000. It doesn't sound 000. like it. And part of that, I it mean. It cuts both ways to me. It, to me, it's that it, we keep talking about the micro industries, right? The idea mm -hmm. that different sectors have different pressures, got over leveraged at different times, and they're kind of working like different cylinders of a car, kind of calibrating perfectly. Do you like that? That's yeah, I my like car that. It's very good. It's, you know, it's that's about as like, far as it goes. Know, Kevin Tyne and uh, car talk. <laughs> I look at it, Lisa, as simple as I was so wrong 90 days ago on subdued Q3 GDP, maybe it was 100 days ago. And are we going to do that again? Are we going to do this ballet again? If you look at the Atlanta GDP now, it's pointing to 1.2% for the fourth quarter, which would be the lowest growth going back to the second mm -hmm. quarter of last year. That said, it's not that bad, especially considering that we're coming off, what, 5% in the third quarter? That's the kind of level, yeah, deceleration, but from what? And mm -hmm. that's the reality check. What did you learn about credit here today? From credit? Well, I think it's going to be a, a sort of balance between terming out the existing yeah. debt structure. I think it's interesting. Equity, I thought that was really interesting. The idea of what kind of bogey is necessary uh, at this moment, how you achieve that in this world. We're going to continue here at Apollo Global Management. This has been a wonderful visit. We're going to finish strong here with Mike Downing of Athene. From, uh, we're from New York. We're in New York. From below from 59th York. Street. <laughs> this is Bloomberg Surveillance. I think the world is debanking. Everywhere in the world, regulators are favoring investors over banks. That does not mean we're going to see a sun shift. That does not mean the banking business is going out of business. On the margin, though, the growth is going to take place in the investor marketplace rather than in the banking system for good and valid reasons.
Mark Rowan, Apollo Chief Executive Officer, speaking about some of the opportunities going forward uh, for the private investment sphere that's taking on an increasing amount of the activities former relegated to banks. We are here at Apollo headquarters in New York. Tom Keene, Lisa Abramowitz, John Farrow is down uh, getting breakfast, or I think he's not getting breakfast anymore. I think that he's he had now a big breakfast. probably in the he studio. Won, they gave him a biscuit, a sausage and a biscuit. eggs, and, and he said, Mark, I can't do this. I need something bigger. He's even big breakfast. <laughs> well, we'll catch up with him in a little bit. A bit of a, a softness in markets, but no drama after last week's no pretty drama. big week. And given the fact that we had a pretty massive year that was November of returns, we could just see a, a bit of a decline in the S&P yields continuing to go down. This is interesting given the retracement. Ten-year yields now at nearly 420, Tom. That sort of snuck up on me, well, given what people have been you. talking I about. I missed this. On the desk here, I'm so busy work, working with the big breakfast that I'm looking at a 420.69. And I'm sorry, it's four, four or five basis points in a 419, you know, breaks an important point and you begin to wonder what's the path to 399 given the economic data. We were just talking about debanking. I want to talk about de-risking more importantly. Nobody wants to be in the pension business. No one wants to actually come up with the liabilities and match them perfectly, especially after uh, a number of years of zero rates and what that meant. One person has been focused on this and was the sleeper star of the recent earnings season. Mike Downing, chief op uh, operating officer of Athene, the insurance arm here at Apollo. Thank you so much for being with us, Mike. I want to just start with that, the idea of why are you so popular? So first, happy to be here. Thanks for having me. But uh, I would say the reason we're popular is that uh, the pension defined benefit landscape has really been in decline for years. The first part of my, I've been in retirement for 30 years. The first 15, Lucky you. Yeah. That's what I was thinking too. Carry on. The Go first on. 15 of those years was watching the defined benefit landscape slowly implode through regulation and others. And so what you have now on a lot of these companies' balance sheets are legacy obligations. It's no longer a core part of their strategy. They've switched to fine contribution plans, but the risks are still there. And so it's a great place for an insurance company to step in, take over the risk, de-risk the assets, more conservative assets, backing it with capital, and it's a really natural fit. What's the kind of bogey that you're looking for? We were talking about this earlier, how there was the old 8.5% bogey that increasingly people said was impossible as rates went lower and lower, and a lot of these investment firms, a lot of these companies locked in investments at those rates. Now we're looking at real, actual income. What is the bogey that you're targeting for some of these things? In terms of asset yield? Yeah. Yeah, so, so our, with, with our assets in the insurance world, the key difference between <clears throat> companies and insurance, insurance entities is we're regulated pretty heavily in terms of the types of assets we invest in. So our assets are going to be dominated by corporate, corporate bonds, high-quality structured assets, and we're really just looking for incremental yield outperformance mm -hmm. to really provide a good value proposition for these sponsors so they can lift and shift right. their pensions without really having to kick in an extra cash. For those of you scared stiff about your retirement, not that I would know anything about that, this is the most important conversation of the day. It all stayed in Illinois where you were. In Athene, West Des Moines, Iowa, actuarial analysis is gospel. It is religion. Absolutely. You just went through, and this goes back to Sun America and, and people that were competing with Sun America, 14% annuities and the idiocy of 30 years ago. Then we had zero interest rates. You guys about rolled up and died. Now, boom, you're back to a normal rate environment. Can our listeners and viewers recover their retirement plans now that we're back to a normal rate environment? Absolutely. I think we're at the start of a re reawakening of annuities, and it's re we really are at the start of what the golden What kind of age. annuity is going to matter here? Are we talking about variable annuities, or are we going to go back almost on the edge of John Farrow and the Brits? I remember a headline in the FT, the, ex the, the, the annuity, fixed annuity, was 3.98%. That doesn't get it done, does it? It doesn't. And so what we're talking about at Athene is simple retirement guaranteed income, not a lot of fancy bells and whistles. We saw the VA crisis with promises that actuaries right. made couldn't keep. It really put a lot of companies in trouble, lots of complex legacy liabilities out there. Athene's business model is simple. It's, it's guaranteed income. We're looking for some outperformance. And in these markets of, of late, annuities are okay. a very viable alternative to equities. I would suggest we have to fix this now. Under the great historic work of Roger Ferguson, the former vice chairman of the Fed, his work at TIA Cref, do we need further emergency legislation in Washington to allow people to put more in because they're just not going to catch up after the last 15, 20 years? 
Yeah, I think uh, we're seeing more of that occur with Secure Act 2.0. We're seeing steps in the right direction. Just steps in the right direction, direction. no question about it. A lot it. of it's mindset. So the tools are there. The annuity market's huge. It's $300 billion a year. It's still vastly underutilized. That's in large part not due right. to the lack of regulation. That's in large part due to the fact that they've been part of this secret insurance land. And more investment advisors really need to look to yeah. their customers to say, hey, a staple of your portfolio I mean, should be an annuity. I mean, people don't know this. Lisa's model in retirement in five years. <laughs> okay, well, that's not exactly where I was going to go. Yeah. Retirement, not in five years. But really, what is the appropriate age at this point for people to actually retire, given how much money they need to build up? I'm thinking 90. <laughs> what <are> you, <laughs> no, but seriously. Yeah, so our sweet spot mm -hmm. is 55 to 70 year olds. Oh, you're killing me. And still? Really? Still. And, uh, and so it's a transition. So if you think about where the world is today with retirement, Defined benefit plans are gone. So people that are saving, what do they have? They have big piles of assets that have been accumulated. <clears throat> and that's getting you to retirement. But how do you get through retirement? And so the way you get through retirement is through an annuity. An annuity can stabilize your principal. An annuity can guarantee return. An annuity can create payouts so that you don't outlive your assets. No, the way you outlive it is your kid gets a job at Apollo Global Management. <laughs> well, That's the way it no, works but this out. This is the issue, right? How do you know? How do you plan at a time where the life expectancy should be expanding? It wasn't because of COVID, but that was a blip, hopefully. Uh, but people are living so much longer. We talked jokingly about Ozempic. What happens if that makes us all live forever because everyone is thin and fit? Uh, but going forward, is there this sort of point at which it doesn't become feasible mathematically? I think it'll always be feasible, right? So unless life's, lifespan is, is kind of walled off at age 120. So really? <laughs> hopefully that'll change in the... Maybe. In the, in the, I right? don't know. Go and, on. And so what, what'll happen is it's... it's uh, so people are living longer, but incrementally longer. And that's where the protection really fits yeah. in well, is it, it protects against the individual that might live <clears> to 120. And we, we look at it on average. So from the actuarial standpoint, we look at some people die at 60, some people die at 120. Let me ask you this, and I know it's anathema to you, but I'm going to go there. I, I've got a real not in acquaintance with a triple leveraged all cash fund, which is taking cash. You take out some fees. Everybody makes money. Is the solution here to take the conservative structure of Athene annuities and provide leverage into them to get a better return for conservative types? Absolutely, and not even conservative types, right? So if you think again about what an annuity delivers, it's not going to deliver a home run. But at age 70, you don't want a home run. What you want is confidence. You're not going to outlive I, I your can retirement. Can you lower the tuition payments, <laughs> please? And that's what annuities do. They help retirees retire in confidence that they're not going to outlive. You know what I find interesting? We have this pool of capital, and it's not actually being spent. And it's sort of the uh, assets that increasingly there's a pool of cash just sitting in assets that don't ever come out for a long period of time. How does that <clears throat> shift it in terms of all of the savings that just are not going to get spent because they're basically pools of capital to earn income off of? Yeah, that's a great, great question and great observation, Lisa. And, and one thing we've seen, so as rates have gone from basically zero to three or 4%, a lot of that cash that's been sitting on the sideline has actually mm -hmm. flooded into the insurance market. Uh, and we've seen volumes, uh, the volumes in the, def in the deferred annuity market have almost doubled overnight from well, low rates yield. to, yeah, because yeah. we're finally getting yield again. And money that was sitting in money markets earning one or two basis points, CDs earning 50 basis points. Right. A lot of that's now migrated to yeah. the annuity market because the annuity returns yeah. have kind of moved real term with rates. We're going to go on to other things. If you see Zelda or Rowan in the hall today, can you say thank you? Absolutely. For this has been a wonderful three hours. Absolutely. Yes. I, we've not only have we learned a lot. But, you know, the coffee's decent. Can we come back? Absolutely. Okay, come back you know what we can do? West Des Moines, Iowa, February? <laughs> it's a treat. <laughs> <laughs> You're just treating me. All right. I spent time in the Dakotas <clears throat> in the winter. That was a treat. Right now, uh, in markets, you are seeing a bit of a softness. We were talking about that 10-year yields, and I do want to pick up on that. Yesterday, unclear what exactly was driving uh, a Look bit at that, of under a 420. Turnaround. But yeah, under 420 and grinding lower as the session uh, oh, grows gosh. on. This is some of the lows that we haven't seen since uh, the end of August. Their, their annuities are going to gross 2% here any day. <laughs> well, this is the question, <laughs> right? Going forward, uh, coming up on Bloomberg TV, Mark Smucker to talk about Twinkies and peanut butter from Marmalade Jam. No. Uh, J.M. Smucker, President I and guess CEO. About Twinkies. Well, okay, we'll hear about Twinkies. Thank you, Apollo. Thank you, Apollo. It was really wonderful to be here.